and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, gang? I hope you had a great weekend. Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you. And oh my God, are we packed today? Uh, we've got lots to talk about on the Jets front as Jets star players are named in trade rumors around the league. We've got a bomber home opener victory to discuss. And we've got an all-time Canadian sports moment yesterday on the golf course out at Oakdale in Toronto as Nick Taylor, Winnipeg-born, wins the RBC Canadian Open on a 72-foot bomb for Eagle that uh, looked more like the uh, end of a Ryder Cup or a President's Cup than a PGA Tour event. Um, it is going to be a fun, fun show. We'll talk about Nick Taylor's historic win towards the end of the program with Adam Scully from Golf Talk Canada and from uh, TSN Sports. Tomorrow, actually, Mark Sakino is going to join us. The, it, so much fun talking golf this week because, of course, it is the U.S. Open in Los Angeles. And I think that's part of the reason why you saw... Shane Lowry and Tyrrell Hatton and Justin Rose out there pulling for their boy Tommy Fleetwood, as well as Hadwin and Connors and Mike Weir and all those guys. Uh, they had to wait anyways because the charter wasn't leaving until the champion and the trophy was on the plane from the RBC Canadian Open out to Los Angeles for the uh, for the U.S. Open. So Mark Sakino is going to join us tomorrow from L.A. So we'll get a little bit more from what happened on the weekend, but more so a look ahead. And of course... Tournament host, unofficial tournament host, Jeff Feinberg. Uh, we'll look to get Feinberg on on hopefully Wednesday's show with some picks before the event. By the way, just quick note for uh, golf fans. If you want to play in our DraftKings contest for the U.S. Open, it's out right now at the Winnipeg Sports Talk League. Send us a tweet if you're uh, not sure where to find it. Um, and I've actually talked to our pal Eric over at TaylorMade. He's going to throw a little tailor-made prize pack in for the uh, for the contest as well. So just a little bit of housekeeping on that. Get your picks in and uh, reserve your spot. We'll have up to 100 people in it. Uh, and, of course, things get going early morning on a Thursday. But uh, Bombers, Cup Final, we've got it all today. Uh, and we also have a game tonight at Candlelight Center. Sea Bears back in action. What a road trip for the Sea Bears. Went 3-1. and one. And uh, they're at home tonight. So uh, we've got a busy, busy show today. Welcome to everyone. Hope you had a great weekend. We'll get Remus in here in just a second. Before we do that, have to give a big thanks to all of our sponsors, uh, Cineboy Downs and the Gold Eyes. A tough weekend. Gr glorious, glorious times at the ballpark. Just that Kansas City team is an absolute problem right now. They, uh, they showed why they're the number one team so far this league. Uh, friends at Modern Man Barbershop, Aquatech, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Vita Health, Wallace and Wallace, F Apparel, Nick and Nikki DQ, Princess Auto, Consolidated Supply, BP, Royal Sports, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Little Brown Jug, Breezy Bend, and of course, our partners at CoolBet. And folks, two weeks from today, June 26th, you want to make, make sure to join us all week long because with uh, everything happening around the Jets and lots of intrigue as to what player moves will be made as well as the draft, Winnipeg Sports Talk will be live in Nashville beginning on Monday the 26th. And Winnipeg Sports Talk at the NHL Draft is presented by our sponsors at CoolBet. Cannot wait for that. So 14 days today, we'll be down in Music City. Uh, and who knows whether Pierre-Luc Dubois or Connor Hellebuck will still be members of the Winnipeg Jets at that point, and even more in doubt whether they'll be members of the Winnipeg Jets at the end of that week. Uh, but I'll tell you what, let's just get right to it and welcome in Michael Remus 
as well as everybody in chat. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and uh, hit that red subscribe button as well. Remo, what is good, man? How was your weekend? Oh, man, it was awesome. Uh, started off with the Bomber game Friday, some great weather, uh, you know, getting my fix of CFL football. Uh, all weekend because there's no more. I know I talked all last week. I love Saturday night CFL football. I love Saturday night, 9 p.m. That's not a thing anymore. I just learned it's now Sunday, 6 p.m. football. So we did have games all weekend. That was great. And Stanley Cup final. And oh, yeah, there was some Jets news that broke Saturday as well <laughs> that we're going to talk about. So uh, a really nice summer weekend uh, for me, Hustler. Um, yeah, listen, it was awesome. I was everywhere on the weekend. I went to the Gold Eyes game on, well, first of all, the Bomber game on Friday. We'll get to that in a second. Gold Eyes on Saturday. Uh, and then yesterday put in an absolute shift sitting on my keister watching all of that incredible drama from Oakdale. And then of course the CFL game at night. I'm kind of here for the Sunday night games, Reem. Um, you know, often it seems in the summer, all we had was Sunday night baseball, I can sometimes get into one of those games, but it was nice to have a game uh, between the Riders, who the Bombers are going to be playing this week. That kind of caught me off guard. I didn't look ahead to the schedule very much. I was sort of surprised to find out that week two is a Bomber-Rider game, this one in Regina. Um, but we'll be, I'm here for the Sunday night games, but I'll tell you what, that Friday night game was something else. Um, 29,000 plus at the stadium. Gorgeous night. Great crowd. And um, the Bombers made a pretty big statement that they are going to be a problem for the rest of the Canadian Football League. All that being said, it was a bizarre game. Hamilton did absolutely nothing offensively, pretty much the entire game. And the Winnipeg Blue Bombers did everything they could over just a small stretch of play in the second half, having a punt blocked that ended up being a touchdown. Zach Caleros got blown up in the backfield. The ball got scooped up and brought in for a touchdown. And then on the next kickoff, Janarian Grant fumbled, and it was returned down to the two, and Hamilton put it in. It almost seemed like the impossible was about to happen. But once again, Bombers got the ball, went down, scored, and pretty much put a fork in the Hamilton Tiger Cats. The score probably doesn't describe how lopsided this game was, um, but it made it interesting, I guess, for the fans watching on TV and the ones that were there. Bottom line is Zach Caleros and his teammates were ready to go. I thought the defense played a phenomenal game. A couple things the Bombers would like to clean up, but very much a statement win that uh, the road to the Grey Cup goes through the peg. Oh, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any power rankings, but the Bombers are for sure number one. Uh, Zach Caleros looking like MOP. Absolutely incredible. 354 yards, three touchdowns. Olivera, 106 yards, a touchdown. And that's just rushing, not including his receiving. Dembski, six catches, 113 yards, and a touchdown. Didn't get, didn't even need to get a whole lot from Dalton's show. I mean, this Dembski was a. was unbelievable. Unbelievable on Friday night. This was a dominating performance. Uh, so they were up 39 17. What's shocking to me, I, I don't know, I haven't looked up, looked it up, but last year the Bombers had some crazy fourth quarter point differential, I remember, for most of the season. And what they were outscored 14 3 in the fourth quarter. They just you know gave Hamilton what it was a fumble six and then a fumble off a of a kick return. But I got right back in and I was texting my mom. She's like, What's the score in the game? I'm like, oh bombers won. It's over. I texted her back five minutes later. Wait, 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 hold on a sec. No, it's not done yet. But uh thank thankfully they brought back Sergio Castillo has four for four, including oh. uh one to you know a little insurance marker there in the fourth quarter. So nice to well, see. That, and that was a yeah. long one. I mean, that I, I'll be honest. And it seemed like the wind in the game, you know, when you were sitting in the stands and I was sort of in the corner um, by the end zone for most of the game, you know, you didn't really feel it at all in the seats, but you did see the, the, the um, things on top of the, uh, the ribbons or whatever on top of the goalposts. You know, we're sort of going back and forth at sometimes a little bit more, but then you saw what happened when the kickers were kicking, and both of them were impacted on both punts and kickoffs. So I didn't think that was a sure thing at all. Um, but listen, that's why they brought him back. Absolute nails performance by Castillo in his return to blue and gold, a big part of the win 
but they should not have had to have been leaning on Sergio Castillo for that late field goal, considering the lead that they'd put up. But you named it, the crazy football league, man. I mean, crazy things happened. They did in that football game. The Bombers were able to win. And as I mentioned now, short week, off day today, practice for a couple days, walk through on Thursday, and a trip out to Regina to take on the Riders to get into the weekend. Yeah, already week two, big rivalry game. But I, I do want to give a shout. I see a lot of people in chat. Darcy Oak at halftime show. I mean, how often is a magic show? The halftime show, and I think people were blown away. Did you see it? Yeah, you sent me the video. You said you still can't figure out how we like, went like, from. Did they, sh- did they show it on TV? Um, <laughs> I actually dozed off, dozed off during during the halftime. So I, I don't know if they did, but you sent me the video, and uh, it, it, it was it was the craziest damn thing I've ever seen. Like, I mean, I. I don't know a lot about that stuff. And listen, I didn't watch the America's Got Talent. I've known of Darcy Oak, and I know that he's sort of world-renowned. But, oh, my God, that <laughs> that trick that he did. I mean, he walks out to center field. He's got a box. It's clear. You can walk through it. It's at the 50-yard line. He goes into the thing with the straight jacket on, and then they pull the thing down. There's no one in it, and he's in the rum hut. He's in the rum hut? <laughs> that, that's where he appeared. Uh, okay. They basically his... dropped the thing up, and he appears at the rum hut with a bunch of fireworks coming up beside him. It, it was the damnedest thing. I, I, I sat there for about a minute with uh, with my friends that I was with going, what what just happened? That did <clears> – <throat> anyways, shout out to Darcy Oak and the Bombers. Man, what an awesome, awesome halftime act. And usually, I mean, I think you know me. I'm not really sticking around for a halftime show. If it's a music or something, no. Um, but I made a point of hanging around at halftime to see that, and I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, and people are saying they did not show it uh, show it on TV. Uh, so Another like, reason I was to go to the game. I, was I don't know her, why yeah. anyone would have missed that game. Friday night, home opener. Um I'll tell you what, if you missed it or you couldn't make it, make a point of getting out there the next time. I think the next home game is actually a Thursday nighter. Um, week Thursday on the 22nd uh, against the BC Lions. So that'll be the next time we get a chance to get to IG Field. But uh, overall, great game, great performance by the Bomber. I, I will say this, great performance by the Bombers on offense and defense. I did think after the game that Mike O'Shea probably – we'll be spending a little bit more time with the special teams units uh, because as great as Castillo was kicking the ball, I thought that the, well, certainly, listen, they got a punt block for a touchdown. That's a major red flag. And I didn't think the kick coverage was particularly good. Um, Just as far as yards allowed. I mean, Hamilton did have some nice field position. Uh, They moved the ball far better returning kicks than they did when Bo Levi Mitchell had the football. Uh, but, man, both sides of the line of scrimmage, offensive and defensive, really, really good and a hell of a way to start the season. And just quickly, before we move on to the jet stream, um, the, uh, you know, Montreal got their win uh, against Ottawa on the weekend. Um, but last night's game was crazy, too. Uh, Riders and Elks, uh, most of us, I'm sure, turned over to that as soon as the golf was over. And uh, a back-and-forth game that had, what, a 102-yard touchdown by Geno Lewis. And then down 17 to 13 late in the game, Elks get a first down on the goal line and get stuffed three straight times. Edmonton has lost 18 straight home games dating back to 2019. Uh, the drought continues at home. So listening to Dusty and just in the lock shop with him, Elks fans, I mean, they had a great crowd and they've been working so hard to get the fans back and then to kind of lose in the fashion that they did, I guess better than just not being competitive. Uh, but it was a real, it was a hell of a way to start the Canadian Football League for the first week and uh, Ryder fans are going to be pumping their chest so getting ready for the Bombers on Friday. Yeah, and there was a, what debuts, uh, Bo Levi Mitchell's debut with his new team, the Tie Cats. Uh, here on Friday, and I gotta be honest, he if you think Hamilton's gonna win the Grey Cup or gonna be there with him at quarterback playing like he did, they're not gonna get there with performances like that 17 of 33, 
197 yards, one touchdown, two picks. Um, I, I don't know if it was a case of him being on a new team and adjusting it to his receivers because, I mean, there were missed throws, just completely missing, or throws just not hitting a guy in stride. And that was why he got benched in Calgary. And now his replacement that pick that he threw early on was terrible. I mean, yeah. and, Ka- and Hamilton was very much in that game at that time. I thought that yeah. was really sort of the, uh, the big turnaround. But, yeah, no, Bull Levi did not look good. And you know what? Listen, I, everyone's in chat talking about this. We should get to it right now. I was going to save it for Jeff Hamilton. But for all the talk and maybe laughing at Edmonton for not being able to get that ball in from the one-yard line, that happened with the Bombers too. Piggy T couple chances from the one and it did not go well and you know with a younger quarterback that's new I mean we've seen how great he can run the football I think it was just assumed and I'm just, I was certainly guilty of that that this would just be an automatic you get him in that spot and he's going to take it in every time well that didn't happen now they ended up getting a safety and a field goal before the end of the half so you know they ended up still getting five points out of that opportunity which was a heck of a good job to salvage it the way that they did. But we saw later on it was Drew Brown in on short yardage. So that's going to be something to watch as well, uh, the short yardage unit and um, just where Pigrom fits into this bomber offense after getting the opportunity early on but not making the most of it. Yeah, regular season at the goal line, a bit different than preseason. And we know what an important role has the goal line quarterback is with the Bombers, and I say that somewhat sarcastically, but they've led the team in touchdowns. Maybe not last year. I think it was showing the leader last year. There was the Sean yeah. McGuire the year before, and a Prukop was a huge part. So you got to be able to punch it in, and Edmonton was not able to. And I thought, Edmonton, this is their year. This is the time they're going to get that first home win since 2019. And it was not to be as they knocked on the door. But how about everyone's talking about uh, Saskatchewan trying to run out the clock? Rollo Tre- Trevor Harris. What and the he hell got, was that? And then he got uh, pushed to the ground. You know, their the game was pretty much over. And he left, like, holding his back. Hopefully he's okay. Uh, Edmonton did get the ball back. Cornelius got sacked. Shout out to give myself a pat on the back. I think that put me in the money on DraftKings, that Rough Riders sack. Six sacks yesterday and Taylor Cornelius. And they gave him that huge contract. I was like... I was like, I don't know. Cornelius, like, he's got a good arm and he can run, but, like, he's not not that great. So I think it's pretty clear, you know, looking at the quarterbacks around the league. And we did see you at Cody Fajardo's debut in Montreal. This quarterback carousel, I think, is hilarious. Like, yesterday was, yeah, Harris used to be on Edmonton. Now he's on, it was on Saskatchewan. But um, it's pretty clear, you know, the Bombers, they've got far and away the MOP if anyone had any doubts about Zach Claris. Yeah, no doubt. Well, uh, shout out to everyone that was in our CFL DraftKings contest. We'll crank another one out, getting ready. Got to get your picks in for Thursday, I guess, when the CFL schedule this week uh, starts. And if you just popped in late, uh, we will be doing, and it's up right now if you're in our Winnipeg Sports Talk League, uh, a contest for the U.S. Open. And I talked to Easy e last night, and we'll uh, get a nice little... uh, little tailor-made package for uh, for a winner as well. So um, anyways, get in on that 100 spots. It's open right now. I think about 25 people jumped on basically as soon as we got it open. All right. Uh, we are going to be talking hockey and heading to the cup final with Stephen Wino in a couple minutes, Remo. But let's quickly get to the big Jets news coming out of the uh, last few days since we've been on the air. Uh the Athletic reporting on the weekend that Connor Hellebuck will not sign an extension with the Jets, and it is no secret. I believe the term was the ship has sailed on that, which certainly makes the likelihood of Hellebuck being traded uh, much greater if that is indeed the case. Yeah, the news coming out uh, Saturday morning and The Athletic, uh, who was it, Eric Duhacek, this team of, this three-team, uh, three-headed monster of reporters, Eric Duhacek, uh, Michael Russo, and Pierre Lebrun, all reporting, and I can't really say I'm surprised, Hustler. We heard Hellebuck at the end of the season saying he knows he's running out of time, he really wants to win a cup, he sees what's going on with the Jets, and he's like, yeah, it's not going to be here in the next couple of years. And he says, and I think it's really too bad. Um, you know, this is a guy who you'd like to see him spend his whole career in a Jets uniform, but if they're, they haven't been able to put a, a team, a complete team together, he's played the most games out of anyone. He's seen the most shots in the last couple of seasons. He's a Vesna Trophy 
winner and he wants to win a cup. And I think, you know, I put that out there and people are like, you know what? He, you know, he served, served his time, time here. Um, you wish him all the best and you see where he's coming from. And, you know, for all this talk about the Jets not wanting to rebuild, I think this rebuild is staring at them right in the face here when you have now two guys who are for sure, seem seemingly for sure, because uh, on the move, because if you're not going to resign here, you do have to trade Hellebuck to get something at some point. Yeah, well, and again, to me, it just all goes down to the definition of rebuild because, I mean, I, 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 I am actually with management in one case is that, I mean, the Jets still do have a bunch of great players on the team. Like for everyone that's saying, oh, this is a rebuild. You have to do a rebuild. Well, so are you trading Connor? Are you trading Nikolai Ehlers? I mean, I sorry, I guess it depends on your definition of a rebuild. And yo, I don't think you start trading everyone, but yeah, trade those guys, see what you can get. And like, you're not going to compete as, you know, as much as you think you like, you're going to take a step back the next two years. And then maybe in two years, um, you're, you know, when you have your prospects coming up, but yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not saying trade like those guys, but yeah, you got to trade these guys and you're not going to like, they're guys with one year left on their contracts. You're not going to get, um, you know, players with term for that. So Trade them for you know picks and and prospects, right? Or you might, or a young you, player. I mean, listen, you might get players with term. I mean, there's no well, and again, term of team control. I mean, whether the contracts are signed. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where I've been going. And and you know, this is an interesting segue into uh, a little couple tidbits from Elliot Friedman um, today. Um, because, you know, of course, Elliot was the one that I think, I don't want to say poured a little cold water on teams not named Montreal Canadiens for Pierre-Luc Dubois, but today on 32 Thoughts, we did hear the name of another team that hockey's number one insider believes is very interested in Pierre-Luc Dubois. Remo, if you can, let's get this clip. This is Elliot Friedman on what he's hearing about interest in Dubois and a certain team in Tinseltown that has their eyes on number 80 of the Winnipeg Jets. There are some teams here who really think that L.A. is going to take a a run at him. You know, we mentioned it quickly the other day. There's always a surprise team, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, Kopitar's got one year left under his contract. And, you know, I don't know what the future is there. I, I, I'm i not trying to start anything. I had some guys tell me that they think L.A. is going to take a big run at this guy. All right. So the Los Angeles Kings. And that's a team that we've talked about as a potential landing spot for Dubois for a while in this program. And part of it came from a discussion where, okay, what should the Jets be looking for in this? Well, it's a younger player, preferably on an ELC, that may be available, that, you know, their situation might have might have changed. And the name that we brought up was Quinton Byfield, who hasn't yet popped, was a number two overall pick. Um, if LA believes that they're going to win now and are pushing their chips in, going for a player like Dubois, Might a player like Byfield be available to the Winnipeg Jets? Not sure whether he's untouchable or not, but that name did come up on 32 Thoughts. Elliot wondered about what this report of interest in Dubois, major interest in Dubois, means, uh, as well as what Dubois' contract might look like. You know, I, I think that sometimes as a prospect, you have to knock down the door. Byfield in that series against Edmonton, I thought he had some really good moments. I just wish he would have scored. I think if he scores once there, yeah. it, we're having a very different conversation. But he didn't knock down the door, Jeff. Like, I think there's a lot there, and I, I agree with you. I still think there's a lot more to give. But, like, I just didn't see anything in that series that would say to me the Kings have to say, we absolutely have to give him one of our top two center jobs right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after two years of getting knocked out in the first round, you don't want to go backwards. Anyway, we'll see where this goes, but someone said to me, L.A., and, you know, the other thing, too, is the contract, a lot of people are assuming eight times nine, and I don't think that's wrong, but I think, you know, what some people are telling me, there's probably, like, a little bit of a swing there. Like, it's as high as Barzell, which is 9.15, and it could go as low as Larkin, which is 8.75, so it's going to be somewhere in that range. 
All right, so there is uh, Elliot on the Byfield situation, um, but what that might mean for Quentin Byfield, and it's interesting looking at the chat. I mean, uh, you know, Elliot makes a lot of sense, but Byfield's not available as far as I believe, and that could that could be the case. Um, but again, if you're talking about a major push, and think about that center ice position there. I mean, Phil Deneau signed for another four years. So, I mean, if you're making that commitment to Pierre-Luc Dubois, I mean, he's damn sure going to be in your top two centers, if not your number one center. And that, of course, includes Kopitar next year. I mean, are they going to keep Byfield around to be a fourth liner? And what's that's going to cost them? All I'll say is this. I mean, there could be more things added into the deal. I would not rule it out. And personally, as I've mentioned this when I first brought his name up a couple of months ago when we were talking about potentially moving a Pierre-Luc Dubois, I mean, if the Jets can bring a player back that is younger, that is manageable under team control for a number of years, with the potential to pop, I mean, there's no guarantees. I mean, that's the sort of risk that I think is worth taking. And I know there's some people that saying that he's untouchable, but I'm not sure that he is. Um, you know, he played a lot this year. I mean, the offensive numbers weren't weren't there. What, what would he look like getting an opportunity to play with a Kyle Connor or a Nikolai Ehlers? I mean, that's another question entirely, and you would hope that that's potential for him to, you know, really grow into that star player they thought they were getting at number two who's there. But, guys, we've seen number two picks traded before. <laughs> I don't need to remind anybody here. Um, so that is going to be something to watch. We'll talk about this with Hammer coming up a little bit later on. But uh, interesting, Remo, that we got a definitive report on one team that Elliot, who's pretty damn plugged in, is hearing is going to make a big run at Dubois. And uh, hopefully there might be another team or two involved, which will put Kevin Chevaldeoff off in a much better position. I think a lot of people thought that he would be considering the reports of Montreal, and that's pretty much it over the course of the last year. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens with Dubois. I think the Hellebuck one, and I think more teams... Will be interested in that one. I think you'd be able to get a bigger, bigger haul. And it's you know interesting. You know you're seeing Stanley Cup final two different ways of goaltending. One team has the ten million dollar goalie. Another team has like a mix, of, used a mix of six different goalies uh, this season. And you saw what the Avalanche used Darcy uh, Darcy Kemper. And you're going to talk about this with Wino, but Tampa had you know uh, Vasilevsky, Hall of Fame goalie. So I'm curious about the market. Or Hellebuck, or Dubois. I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Is it going to be Montreal? Is he going to go somewhere and sign an extension? Like those numbers he threw out there, um, I think are pretty, uh, pretty high. And you know, we're putting out. We had a video on this channel over the weekend. Got got a ton of views, and everyone's like, he's, he's not worth nine million dollar player. He's never had thirty goal season. He's had, never had what seventy point season. How can you get that much if you're not even point per game has? Now he showed. He was point per game in what the first half of the year, and then took a bit of a, a fall off. The whole team had a fall off in the second half. I don't know with him if it was injuries or motivation or or what with Dubois, but he hasn't you know proved that he's you know that kind of elite scorer like other guys like I don't know Rupe Hints, who's who we talked about with guys, uh, last week. It, 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 listen for everyone, and you can all have your take on whether he's worth nine million dollars or worth eight million dollars in the comparison comparisons. <laughs> Here's the reality. This contract is going to be buying all UFA years. Yes. Those are more expensive than RFA years. The team that signs him is basically getting him to forego unrestricted free agency. There is a premium on that. So you combine that with a guy that has, while he hasn't been a point of game player, he has been productive. He was right there. I mean, if he didn't miss the games that he missed, he probably scores 30 and finishes in the 70 point range. But there's also another side to Dubois that's not really quantifiable in the goals and assists um, that teams want. And it is that pain in the ass to play against. It is that physicality, the strength that he has. Now I'm the first one to admit, and I've said it a number of times, I mean, the great Dubois is elite, unbelievable. See game one. The unengaged, not into it Dubois is terrible see game number five so I totally get people making their takes on oh is this guy worth it or 
you know, I would never give him that. Well, that's fine. And guess what? The Jets aren't giving it to him anyways. So don't worry about it. But if you're a Jets fan, you got to hope that there are teams that are interested in paying him that. And if they're interested in paying him that, that means they're interested in making a fair deal and getting him from some other teams that are involved. And uh, to me, L.A. is a team that we thought had been a potential fit. Hearing Elliot talk about that today, I think, uh, can only be good for Winnipeg because they said what they need to have happen right now is I have a few suitors in there that are serious about acquiring Pierre-Luc Dubois because that, at the end of the day, if you're a Jet fan, all you care about, like these guys are done. They're gone. All you care about is what comes back to this team, what they look like going forward, and what sort of value you can salvage from a player with one year left of team control. We'll get to that with Hammer coming up in a few minutes. Uh, but we are going to talk cup final before we do that uh, with our pal Stephen Wino, who's been covering the series. Uh, but hey, gang, uh, Father's Day is coming up. And Modern Man wants to spoil the Dapper Dads this Father's Day from now until June 19th. If you purchase a $40 gift card, they'll load it as $50. Of course, Modern Man Barbershops have eight locations in Winnipeg and a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Uh, you can visit Modern Man on Instagram at Modern Man Barbershops for a chance to win a year's supply of Dapper Dan hair products for you or for dad right now. And again, uh, you can uh, make your look or make your appointment or book your look at modernmanbarber.com. Uh, the gorgeous weather continues, going to hit 30 the next couple of days, it looks like. Why not make 2023 the year you take the plunge with AquaTech? Visit aqua-tech.ca to design your own custom pool. Their team can provide on-the-spot pricing from designers as well as financing options that suit you. And uh, heck, pools are one thing, but whole home renos start with AquaTech as well. With thousands of renovations as their foundation, let them upgrade any space in your home. Uh, AquaTech's ready to make your reno dreams a reality. Learn more about design, pricing, and financing options at aqua-tech.ca. Uh, anyone get to the lake on the weekend? You get over onto a on the boat? Well, Manitoba Batteries got you covered because the boat battery blowout sale continues as part of Manitoba Batteries 10 year anniversary. Right now, for you for your fishing or trolling motor batteries, they've got it all for you right now, including regular 10-inch 140 min reserve capacity deep cycle batteries for 105 or a higher quality AGM version of the same 10-inch battery that usually sells for 219 for only 13950. Or how about the hot new lithium technology, a 100 amp hour lithium battery that only weighs 22 pounds for just $599, which is a $200 savings. Any way you slice it, Manitoba Batteries got you covered for your boat battery needs. At the best prices in town, you'll be shopping local. And the most convenient purchasing experience is they'll deliver it anywhere in the city for free when you order it. Uh, these incredible prices run until June 17th. For more information on the boat battery blowout sale, give them a call. Go to manitobabattery.com or pop by and see them at 1026 Logan Avenue. And, uh, well, there was, I'll say this. I was at the game on Friday, and I can confirm people love the Canadian Club and Ginger Ale, and I'm not sure there was any left in that stadium by the end of Friday night because uh, they were everywhere last night. Got so many folks came up and said hi. Thanks again to everyone that pops by and gives a little love to the show. It was really, really cool to see so many people out there. And a good half of them were drinking Canadian Club and Ginger Ale in those cans. Of course, there was a lot of people posted up around the Rum Hut too, enjoying Canadian Club. Canadian Club is Canada's favorite whiskey and the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Uh, June 22nd is the next time we'll get together to enjoy CC and Gingers at the stadium. In the meantime, pick it up in singles or six packs at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts or your favorite beer store. All right, Jeff Hamilton is coming up. We are going to talk about Nick Taylor's incredible win at the RBC Canadian Open in hour two as well. Uh, but first up, let's head to the cup final right now and welcome in Stephen Wino of the AP for the latest on the NHL Championship Series and more. Wino, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing great, Hustler. How are you doing? Oh, you know, doing well. I, I, like many people, are sort of ready to move on to the full off season, although we're sort of in off season mode right now. But um, 
it could be in the next 48 hours that we have a Stanley Cup champ as uh, the Vegas Golden Knights are that close. Uh, what did you think of the two games in Florida and, um, you know, the way that the Panthers found a way to win game three, albeit up against it late, and then obviously Vegas doing what they had to do to get within 60 minutes of a championship? Yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty fitting, actually, because Vegas has proven to be the better team in this series and, and really the best team in the Western Conference and, and just built up really from kind of October on as the best team in the NHL, but also fitting that the Panthers sort of don't go away sort of story that, that, that they've, that's followed them really since the last few weeks of the season and for them since December and January when they were in playoff mode kind of the entire time just to be able to get into a spot after a bunch of injuries earlier in the season that, that it really did fit the narrative for both of these teams right like the, the, the Vegas Golden Knights clearly have been better but the, the, the Florida Panthers have this with Matthew Kachuk specifically ability to just not go away and be annoying and pester some of these teams that on paper are more talented you know the, the Saturday game was interesting in that um I mean listen Florida has gotten um undisciplined at times I mean to be honest it's almost a, a trademark of Maurice teams early on and then they will sort of dial it back. They were going to try to dial it back, apparently, at home after the way things went in Vegas. Certainly didn't end that way. Um, what have you made of the the challenge for Florida to stay on the right side of the officials? Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. And, and amazing that only one penalty was called for most of that game until Alex Petrangelo puts the puck over the glass and then kind of the, the, the fragus at the end of the game. That they know this, and and, and Bruce Cassidy has said this. The, the Panthers are the most penalized team in hockey, and, and it's something that, that Vegas, with the power play, has been able to get clicking and, and really take advantage of that. But it, it is a weakness of this Florida uh, of the Florida Panthers now, in that there's there's a certain there's a certain level of of physicality and toughness you can handle penalties for. The St. Louis Blues did this to, to Cassidy's Bruins in 2019. That if you're going to hit and it's going to be roughing penalties and, and kind of penalties of physicality that build up the attrition over the course of the series, there's meaning to it. If it's you're chasing the play and it's hooking and tripping and you're behind guys, and then it's just undisciplined. And 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 Paul Maurice admitted this during the series that there is a little bit of a kind of a sensitivity to how undisciplined the Panthers are because as good as as Vegas has been on the power play this series, they can't afford to take dumb penalties. We saw some of the Panthers' uh, identity come out at the end of Game Four. <laughs> Unfortunately, too little, too late. And, of course, Matthew Kachuk right in the middle of it. But we hadn't seen a lot of Kachuk in the third period. Um, what do we know about his situation? Why was he out of the game? And he certainly seemed to have some of the uh, piss and vinegar that often you associate with them there at the end when they, uh, that final buzzer had gone. Yeah, it doesn't say Matthew Kachuk is not 100% at this point. He wouldn't tell us exactly when the hit occurred, the injury occurred, kind of what specifically was bothering him. But it was clear, like, he may be playing with one arm. He may be playing uh, kind of limping. It looked like he was even limping a little bit. We don't know how many injuries Matthew Kachuk has at this point, how much he's playing through. But it would explain why he hasn't been as effective. I'm guessing it happened some point in, in, in earlier in game four because he missed, a, uh, like you mentioned, a big chunk of that third period there. And he's the guy who drives the, the bus for, for, for Florida. He's the guy who is their emotion, the Panthers' emotional leader and, and obviously their leading scorer. Said it, he, he scored the tying goal in game three. He set up, it, it was a big part of, of the overtime winner by Carter Verhage with uh, the pass to the pass to the pass and then a screen in front. He's an important player for them, and, and it's really hard to see the Panthers coming back in this series if Matthew Kachuk's not close to 100%. The crazy thing about Kachuk, Stephen, is, I mean, even after missing most of the third period, they throw him out there at the end, and he's got the tying goal right on his stick. I mean, he always seems to be where the action is, even when he's hurt. Yeah, and and, and they, the misconduct show that too. Like he, he he brings the action to him, and and that's something Matthew Kachuk has done all playoffs. He he scored big goals in the Boston series, in the Toronto series, and in the Carolina series, and, and just seems to be at the center of everything the Panthers do. You know, um, Vegas has been a team; they'll play you however you want, and they are certainly not shy to mix it up physically. But it really has been um, fascinating to see how they have just called the dogs off and been more than happy to make the Florida Panthers pay with the man advantage for their indiscretions. 
Yeah, and, and, and really, to me, that's a sign of a mature team with a mature coach and someone who's been there before, uh, of kind of knowing that this is not going to do us any good by kind of getting involved in all of this. And and the, the power play was, was really not very good for Vegas through the first three rounds. It's been very consistent all season. And But they they found something. They found something on that in that Florida penalty kill on Sergei Bobrovsky to crack uh, and, and, and come through in those situations. It's been a really smart strategy by Bruce Cassidy and his coaching staff. It really kind of through the leaders of that team, from Mark Stone, Alex Petrangelo, all the way down, guys who, who have made long playoff runs before kind of understand it. And and and, and the game plan going in of, of kind of letting the Panthers kind of lose their minds a little bit it has proven to be a winning strategy. Yeah, and, uh, and it's been happening far more often than I think Paul Maurice would have liked. Uh, Maurice is a master. I mean, we've all been in press conferences with him before, and it's very interesting seeing kind of him being uh, up on the highs that he's had many of them, and then, you know, now sort of dealing with the uh, potential mortality of his team in the playoffs. I mean, you've been around most of these pressers. I mean, what have you made about Maurice and the effect that he's had on this Panthers being able to get them this far? Yeah, Eric Stahl said this on, on Media Day to, when I was asking about Maurice, is that this team needed Paul Maurice and Paul Maurice needed this team. That, 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 that there was something that worked about kind of uh, the Florida Panthers coming off off winning the President's Trophy, losing the second round with an inexperienced first-time coach in Andrew Burnett, and then having someone who's the most experienced coach in hockey in, in, in Paul Maurice coming in and kind of taking the reins and, and being almost relaxed about it. And, and I think Paul's demeanor specifically from the Boston series on has been – we got nothing to lose. Like the, the Panthers are playing with house money. If if the Penguins don't lose to the Chicago Blackhawks in, in game 81, the Panthers aren't even in the playoffs. So the, the fact that they've literally been playing with house money this entire time, it, it really fits his identity. And I think he's done a good job of playing that underdog role, basically saying, like, look, look we're not supposed to be here. Everybody else we're playing has been built for this. We're just kind of doing this as we go along. Everyone's picked against us. So what? And he's going to continue that now. I think he does realize that the, the, the kind of the, the deck is stacked against the Panthers at this point, just given the injuries, given just everything that's built up over, over this playoffs, that he, this is not the Boston series. This is not the Panthers are fresh and, and, and healthy and, and ready to make a comeback. But they're going to have the same mentality. And, and, and I think the players have done a good job of kind of taking on Maurice's identity and, and, and embracing sort of everyone doesn't expect us to be at this party, but we're here. Speaking of underdogs, and I know it's hard to put Vegas as an underdog because they were the number one seed, but you look back at a number of these players, how they ended up there, and I think there is somewhat of an underdog mentality built into the uh, ID of this team. But uh, this Aiden Hill story, Stephen, is incredible. And, and, and it's only the first chapter, of course, because he's also an unrestricted free agent. I mean, uh, what have you seen from uh, Aiden Hill uh, and what do you think this does to uh, his viability to be a guy that's, um, well, his agent's probably quite excited for what's to come in the next few weeks. Yeah, Aiden Hill's getting getting paid. And and, and I, there is something that to be said for, for Vegas' system, Bruce Cassidy's system, and how many goaltenders have gone through it. They started five different goalies who, who picked up at least one win during the regular season. They've been able to plug and play whichever kind of goaltender, which would, with whatever kind of style in as possible. Lauren Prasois, you guys know, obviously, from Winnipeg. Jonathan Quick even came in and played. This was a team that was supposed to have Robin Leonard going into the season and, and, and all of that happened. Aiden Hill, and this is nothing to take against Aiden Hill, but he makes the saves that he's supposed to make. And, and it reminds me a lot of Darcy Kemper with the Avalanche last year in, in that he Aiden Hill does make a spectacular save every once in a while, but very rarely will he allow a terrible goal, and very rarely does he have to make a 10-bell save because the way that, that, that the system is set up is very goalie-friendly, to, to kind of keep shots to, to, to where he can see them and, and make saves. And it, if you have a team that can defend well and that can help your goaltender out, I think Aiden Hill's a, a really good fit for someone like that. Now, will he probably get overpaid, for, for the lack of a better term, because of, of winning a Stanley Cup? Probably, sure. But this is where he should cash in on, on, on craziness. I mean, he, he's the first goalie to have 10 wins in a playoff run when not starting until the second round. It, it, it's just it's crazy how productive he has been given the situation no there's no doubt about that speaking of vegas if they do get it done in game five um is marcia so the uh the cup uh the um mvp cons mike I, I, 
I, I think so. And, and, and really, but, but this is, reminds me a little bit of St. Louis in, in 2019, too, is that there's no obvious choice. I mean, March so seems like it based on how he's played in the final. Jack Eichel certainly seems like he's in the conversation. Aiden Hill, even though he didn't play in the first round, has to be in the conversation at this point. I even look at someone like Chandler Stevenson, who was who has scored a lot, now 10 goals on this run. He won a lot of big face-offs, been kind of a very useful player for them. You could make an argument for Mark Stone as a captain and kind of how many big goals he scored. A lot of them similar to Matthew Kachuk, deflection goals, the kind of the all-around defensive game Mark Stone brings. There's a lot of guys you could consider for that. I mean, my my thought at this point is, is Jonathan Marshall. So given just how many important goals he scored, where after having zero in the first round uh, of the playoffs, and kind of what he's done at big moments for this team, being an, an original Vegas Golden Knights player, it, it something seems to fit about Jonathan Marshall so being the most valuable player. Stephen Wino's with us talking cup final and everything else happening around the National Hockey League. Listen, when you've been getting together with the uh, the fellow scribes following this series, how much have you guys been talking about the series and how much have you been talking about everything else happening around the league, including a number of Winnipeg Jets at the top of everyone's trade board? No, a little, little, little bit of everything. And, and, and yes, there, Pierre-Luc Dubois obviously coming up in, in conversation a bunch and a guy who we know now wants a trade and kind of we see this coming, right? That, that, that it'll be a fascinating couple of weeks after the, the cup final is over. We've already seen the trade already with Ivan Provorov going from Philadelphia to Columbus. I know he was someone that, that the Winnipeg Jets were connected to a few years ago when Chuck Fletcher was in charge in Philadelphia. He goes to Columbus. They they go out and get uh, Damon Severson as a as a as a left as a right shot option. They have Provorov as a left shot option. The Columbus Blue Jackets are open for business, uh, and and I don't think Pierre Luc Dubois is going back to Columbus. I think, at least I can say that probably uh, after the situation there didn't end so well. But yeah, the, 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 the next couple of weeks, as soon as the cup final is over and the buyout window opens and we start to see trade talk going up, leading up to the draft and, and at the draft, it, there's going to be a lot of more movement, I think, in the next few weeks than a lot of people expect. I have plenty of reports on the weekend that Connor Hellebuck's next contract will be with the team other than the Winnipeg Jets. And that goaltending market is interesting. We've heard the potential of Carter Hart being on the move. Obviously, Hellebuck would be at the top of anyone's list. John Gibson. But at the same time, you made a great example of Darcy Kemper and now Aiden Hill. I do wonder what, you know, another sort of journeyman goaltender, for lack of a better term, winning a Stanley Cup, assuming Vegas gets it done, does to maybe the real push for these teams to go over the top and get a player like Hellebuck uh, in a trade. I think you can talk, you can justify whatever position you're in, right? I think if you can look and say Andre Vasilevsky won the Stanley Cup twice in a row, took Tampa to a final, and having an elite number one goaltender is important. And and look at Jake Ottinger getting Dallas to a Western Conference final and kind of how important he's been along that way. But, but then you see an A. Hill, you see a Darcy Kemper, you even see the Freddie Anderson, Antti Ranta, Peter Kachekov, sort of like three-headed monster in, in Carolina, and just different ways of, of doing it. And if you've got a team with tons of salary cap space, then you might have the ability to go out and get a John Gibson, a Connor Hellebuck, and you feel like you need a goaltender to win you series, to win you a championship. But you can certainly make the argument that, that if you have the right team in front of a goaltender, it's similar to a quarterback, right? Like the Washington Commanders I cover are trying to say, Sam Howe can do it because the rest of the team is so good. If you're a team that's built like the Vegas Golden Knights, you're probably not paying Aiden Hill this summer. You're probably bringing Lauren Brassois back, and, and and whether it's Jonathan Quick or whether it's whoever your 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 number two goaltender is, uh, Robin Leonard, if he if he is healthy, that you can talk yourself into not needing to spend a whole lot of money on a goaltender if you if 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 you think you have the right team to do it. It's not going to take long for things to get really interesting as soon as this Cup final is over, and that could be as soon as tomorrow night. Um, I would imagine the Winnipeg Jets would be at the top of this list uh, when it comes to most intriguing teams for you over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, who else would be in there along with the long to-do list that Kevin Cheveldayoff has on his desk? Yeah, it's the Philadelphia Flyers because because Danny Breer has, has already shown he's trading Ivan Provorov. He's listening on, on Carter Hart and, and trying to make a deal to trade Craig Carter Hart. The, the Flyers are almost in Blackhawks mode from, from a year ago where they're they're going to start tearing down to the studs. It's not even rebuilding yet. It's it's still in the tearing down purpose there. So you got a lot of players there. Kevin Hayes, uh, Travis Konechny, obviously Carter Hart, who are, are players who by the time the Flyers are good again, they're not going to be in their primes anymore. And 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 so I think Danny Breer and Keith Jones are, are certainly going to be looking to make a lot of moves from, from a selling standpoint. And the other team I look at that's going to be very intriguing is Kyle Dubas and the Pittsburgh Penguins in the East. Is is he's now taking over a team with your your kind of three 
big stars in, in Crosby, Malkin, and Latang, and how do you build around it? Does an Aiden Hill or, or John Gibson wind up going there? You know they're going to need a, kind of a new number one goaltender. And, and the, the the kind of directive from Fenway Sports Group, the ownership there, is they want to keep winning. They want to keep contending. This is not going to be a long-term rebuilding project. But whether it's Kyle Dubas kind of running the show and, or hiring a GM and kind of overseeing the vision, uh, the, looking look, look really closely at Pennsylvania for Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia and the moves they're going to make. Well, and, and Pittsburgh is fascinating in so many ways in that Dubas goes into that job, and it is almost the exact opposite of what he had – in Toronto, I mean, he's not talking about a team that's drafting Mitch Marner fourth and Austin Matthews first. He's looking at a team that has, you know, iconic franchise legends and a league legend in Sidney Crosby that are there, not even on the back nine, like on the final stretches of their careers, signed to deals. I mean, Chris Letang's deal takes him to the age of 41. Um, I, I did wonder when he got that job just how much change or how, how he'd be able to affect things certainly even just going into next season. Yeah, and, and and really, it's it's one of the tougher jobs, I think, in the NHL right now because you have those guys sign long-term and, and you know they're talented and you know they're faces of the franchise, but he's going to have to be really creative of, of building around them because the salary cap's only going up by a million this summer. Uh, you're going to have a bigger increase next year, but it's really hard when you fall out of the playoffs, and the Washington Capitals are dealing with this too, to try to get back in. And, and those are two teams who have both won in Stanley Cup, both kind of have aging rosters and, and long-term contracts of stars and, and try to stay in. It's really hard. I mean, Columbus is going to be coming. Jersey's not going anywhere anytime soon. The Islanders are there. The Rangers are there. It's a really tough division to try to, to contend in that it's it's going to be on Kyle Dubas to try to find, and, and Brian McClellan's been good at this, some reclamation projects, some veterans on one-year prove-it contracts, some sort of cheaper entry level kind of contract guys that when you haven't had a whole lot of first round picks and, and, and highly touted prospects in the system, it's really, it's difficult to try to bring those guys in immediately. It's going to be a really tough and, and fascinating job. Yeah. And I mean, the East, I mean, we were, and then just talking about the wild cards. I mean, you've got Ottawa, you've got Buffalo, you've got Detroit who are all knocking on the door as well. I mean, that landscape of that entire conference, I think, is going to be in flux for the better part of the next couple of years. Stephen Wino's with us. Wino, we'll look forward to seeing you down in Nashville in a couple of weeks for uh, all the draft festivities. Uh, but I can't have you on without asking you something related to the draft. You were in the draft lottery room. Uh, but take us through exactly what that experience was like and what you witnessed. It was it was it was wild. So it, it was just the, the 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 lengths they took to make sure that things didn't leak and, and to prove it was a legitimate system. It, it is fascinating to me just sitting through it for the first time. Like they took our phones like it literally had a manila envelope that we put our phones in and were taken away to a corner of the room. And, and you have Gary Bettman holding up today's newspaper to prove today is actually May 8th. And, and having the lottery technician like an actual this is his job to be a lottery technician holding up the lottery balls to say, this is every one of the balls, load them into the machine. Just the lengths that, it, that, that they showed to have a guy who wasn't even looking yell for them to, to draw each ball. We all had the, the combinations printed out for us of, of kind of what the numbers would be and what it leads to. And, and really, I would love to see that production on TV, as nerdy as it is, to just see, and because you could do it like the World Series of Poker, essentially, where at the start, it looks like whatever, 18.5% for the Anaheim Ducks. After one ball, it, you can change it and see maybe the Ducks have a 37% chance at one point. I think it was down to the Blues, the Sharks, the Capitals all had opportunities by the fourth ball. And then the fourth ball comes up, and they look at the guy from Ernst Young, and it's the Chicago Blackhawks. Okay, let's do it all over again for the second pick. And it was like there was no pomp and circumstance to it. It was just let's draw these, these lottery balls, and they do it every year. It just happens that this year the Blackhawks got a generational talent or won a generational talent in Connor Bedard. Yeah, well, we were quite interested in the lottery balls back in 2016, and uh, you know, you got a little bit of an idea about just you know the different permutations and combinations that could affect the club, but. This one with Connor Bedard, uh, I think probably the most attention, well, certainly since uh, McDavid, if not ever. Um, Steven, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, we'll see whether this one's going to get back to South Florida tomorrow night. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, make a date for a couple cold ones at some point in Nashville in a couple of weeks. Sounds great. See you soon. All right, good stuff with Wino. We'll get to a little bit more hockey talk focusing on the Jets and, of course, the Bombers' home opening win. And a look ahead to... 
the Riders with Jeff Hamilton coming up in just a second. Folks, if you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, groceries, and Winnipeg's largest assortment for the ones of local searching for products, the products you need. Granger. You got to head over to Vita Health Fresh Market. Uh, seven locations in the city. And of course, you can shop online at myavita.ca with local delivery options as well. Barbecue season's in full swing. Get down to Vita Health and stock up on some delicious Vita Market grass fed bison and beef steaks. And with Father's Day around the corner, men's health is top of mind. Garden of Life has created some unique formulas like Prostate Protect. And one's daily men's both contain 50 billion beneficial bacteria to support men's gastrointestinal health. Vita Health, uh, Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. Uh, gang, if you have fencing or overhead door needs, there's only one place to go and one group to call, and that is Wallace and Wallace, the specialist serving residential and commercial customers since 1946. If you need the security and protection of a new fence, or if winter did a number on your old one, give them a buzz. They've got vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood fences. And if it's time to replace your garage door, Wallace & Wallace has Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors. All it takes is a call to 452-2700 for the Wallace & Wallace team to arrange a time to come out and give you a free estimate. And you can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. Um, how's the closet looking, gang? Because we got wedding season basically here upon us right now. Guys, if you need to upgrade your menswear heading into summer, you need to get down to F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. In a wedding party, talk to them about a 15% discount for the crew when you get your suits from F Apparel, and a free custom shirt and tie awaits for 2023 high school grads with the purchase of a new suit. F Apparel is at 190 Smith Street downtown. Make an appointment or check them out online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. Um, and I know it was a busy sports weekend, and I know who else was busy. Uh, the gang over at the Nick and Nicky DQ, because they had four locations, and all have been packed. New summer blizzard flavors are here, and... It is the good kind of blizzard season here in Manitoba. Pop by and try one for yourself at DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, DQ St. Anne's, or DQ Niverville. All right, we will talk golf with uh, Adam Stanley a little later on. But right now, let's welcome in Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press before Adam Scully joins us to uh, talk about Nick Taylor's historic win. Hammer, what's up, man? How was your weekend? Huss, everything uh, everything went well this weekend. Took full advantage of the weather. Certainly took uh, took in that wild Bombers game Friday night. It was great to great to have the CFL back in earnest with the regular season getting kicked off this weekend. And uh, yeah, when it was out on the waters, garage sailing Saturday it wasn't uh, wasn't a long wasn't a long sail. Dropped the anchor for a couple hours and uh, toured around the city and got a few books. Nothing crazy. Just uh, like I mentioned, the off camera just stocked up my uh, bookcase a little bit more and uh, and then had a uh, you know had a nice restful Sunday to, to cap off the weekend you know watch that crazy ending in the uh, the Canadian Open and um, and certainly uh, you know with, I imagine millions and millions of Canadians around the you know over the country and around the world just took that drama in for what it was worth and rewatched the bomber games and watched all the CFL games I actually finished watching the CFL games this morning um, and what a wild weekend it was so you know was, didn't feel like it worked at all, but it, but it was. That, uh, I mean, just quickly on the uh, end of the Canadian Open, as I mentioned, Scully's going to join us later on, and we'll talk more about the significance of it. Um, but it really was just a, an incredible scene. And when you think about the way the week started for the Canadian Open and the PGA Tour, to bring it back to the sport, to the athletes, to what's happening on the course, I think was a big win for all parties involved in the way that it happened. And the craziest thing is, I'm sitting there with a Tommy Fleetwood 25 to one ticket for him to win the tournament. No, you're not. And even as I saw 500 bucks just disintegrate in front of my eyes, I couldn't help be fired up and happy. I mean, it was, it was just, it was really, truly a incredible Canadian sports moment when you added that it had been since 55 since a Canadian had won it. 
and the way that it happened. It's 72 feet. That's the longest putt he's ever sank in his career. And what a time to do it. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, and, and, and it was great. It was great to read about it, to be honest with you. It was awesome to watch it, of course, but to hear about, you know, James Duffy did a great piece kind of behind the scenes and talking to, you know, volunteers and other Canadian golfers that he was with and, and you know, guys saying he's going to make it and saying, you know, everyone just assuming he's just going to get close, you know, so he can force, a, you know, a long putt from Fleetwood but for a playoff. But, I mean, that to me, man, was just – it was unbelievable. I mean, what a, what a sports moment. And then for the chaos to ensue afterwards, I mean, you see all the memes and the videos about being a Canadian moment with Hadwin being just absolutely speared. Speaking of this, talk about golf in the CFL crossing – crossing wires <laughs> sign that guy up for special teams on the winnipeg blue bombers you know he sees just a little bit of uh you know trouble brewing and he uh he takes he takes action you should see that i think what's being lost in that that video i mean the absolute tackle's great but the uh the swim move past the uh the caddy's umbrella or whatever it was <laughs> or there was there was you know you know that guy went into full you know full training mode there so i mean just the whole thing man just how it played out you know, how the, the round opened up, as you mentioned, a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, I think everybody kind of felt whoever loved golf. I, I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I'm the biggest golf fan in the world, but even someone who, you know, who, who enjoys the game, you know, to hear some of the news about, you know, the PGA grouping with the Saudis and whatever, I think that took a, you know, it was a pretty big hit on the game. And then for, for the end of the weekend to, to cap off like that and in the fashion and style of which it did. And I thought it was funny too, right? Because Fleetwood's another guy that you – that you, that you know, and I mean, a lot of people have said this that if that if if you know if if he's if he's you know in other in any other circumstance, Canadians are cheering for this guy and giving him the best. Oh. But to, to hear them booing him and like <laughs> cheering his not booing him but cheering his failures, like it, it just feel it felt so un-Canadian before it, it felt truly Canadian at the end. Yeah, I mean, listen, as someone that's been to a couple Ryder Cups, I mean, it had an absolute Ryder Cup vibe. Um, and listen, that's what the National Open it should be. And, totally. and of course, with all those other top guys having to wait for the charter, they were all out there afterwards. I mean, there mm -hmm. was Rose and Shane Lowry and Tyrrell Hatton pulling for Tommy and all the Canadian guys. And and yeah, Terry Tate, office linebacker, volunteering on the weekend at the 18th hole at Oakdale <laughs> yeah. certainly made a, made an impact as well. Doing um, his job too, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> you don't know what you're, you know, you don't know what's at stake there. You don't, you don't have time to think. You just do. I loved it. Um, listen, I want to get to the Jets uh, with you, but let's start off with the Bombers because, mm. of course, that is uh, your beat for the Winnipeg Free Press. I, 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 takeaways from the game where the Bombers looked awesome. Um, that was, I mean, exactly the way you wanted to see the team come out. I mean, literally, Bo Levi threw that terrible pick in the first quarter, and then it was just, you know, haymaker after haymaker mm -hmm. after haymaker from the Bomber offense. The Bomber defense looked incredible pretty much for the entire game. I mean, you see the score and you go, geez, this game was quite tight. None of that was on the defense for the most part, Jeff. Um, but I'm sure Mike O'Shea will be looking at some of the mistakes that his team made that improbably got the Ticats back in the game. And overall, if there's one area I think of improvement, it probably is in and around special teams. Kick coverage unit and obviously having a punt block, which started everything in for a touchdown, would be where they'd like to start. But uh, overall thoughts on uh, the opening win for the Bombers over the Ticats in your mind? Yeah, just an absolutely wild game. An example, I know you guys are talking about it off the top of the show. Just another, again, another example. Didn't take too long for a reminder of just how crazy the crazy football league can get and that, you know, you really can't sleep on any lead. And um, yeah, to your point, I, I thought I thought things were pretty rough to start with, actually. You know, with Hamilton getting that great return off the opening kickoff and then, you know, having some calculated uh, plays to move the, the the ball downfield and I mean settled for a settled for a field goal but then you know first play from from you know for the Bombers on the offensive side is a fumble by by Nick Dembski and and strong field position uh, you know for them to to add to their lead and you're wondering you know what's going on here I mean this is a team that didn't really give a lot of turnovers up all season last year and to start the season with one on offense um, you know, just didn't really sit right. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Demario Houston, who for many who have followed this team, didn't ha exactly have a great preseason, uh, you know, completely redeemed himself in that game with a pair of interceptions, not just the one that you were you referred to that, you know, pretty much, um, you know, started the three straight consecutive 
consecutive touchdown drives for the Bombers, but then having a you know uh, picking a, off uh, Bo Levi Mitchell in the end zone on a on a two point conversion, and I also had a fumble recovery right on on uh, on one of the plays. So um, I thought the Bombers were absolutely dominant, as you mentioned. I think there was a particular focus for sure. Um, or particular shout outs for the offense who under, you know, Zach Kolaris looks un, you know, unbelievable and, and particularly, at, you know, for long stretches over that game, unstoppable. Um, and I think, you know, I think the game really changed by halftime. I, you know, the Bombers were obviously wanting to slow the game down, control the clock, not try to give any momentum. And the defense was certainly up to the task. Uh, you know, Bo Levi Mitchell, I thought, you know, I, it's, it's hard to be too definitive in your statements after week one, right? I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces with Hamilton, and um, obviously they were a very busy team over the off season. They pretty much bought an entirely new team. They still have a lot of the a lot of the main staples on their club, like the Simone Lawrences, Chris Van Zeels, um, you know, players of that ilk, you know, still kind of lingering around. But a lot of new guys uh, added throughout the off season, so you know that's going to be, you know, that's going to take a bit of time to adjust, and that's really the benefit of the Bombers right now. You know, as I wrote in my five takeaways, continuity matters. The Bombers, it, there's a reason why the Bombers won nine straight last year and have have, have come out of the gate incredibly, you know, um, impressive over the last three years is because it's pretty much the same guys. So while every team's catching up, uh, the Bombers are rolling. As I wrote about earlier in training camp, this team is not only, you know, it was really tough for rookies to make this this team in, in years prior it was really tough for rookies to make the team this year because they need to they needed to impress in the in the studying department because the, the bombers went into training camp this year not introducing you know reintroducing playbooks and, and and plays from previous years they they were building on plays and so um you know i think it was a lot to handle for younger guys but the the, the good news really is there really is only seven new faces on the on the bombers so um but back to the game i thought overall it was just a pure domination certainly special teams while had some very very positive very you know important positive i thought jameson sheehan had some really nice punts uh the punt that he had blocked and and then recovered for a tie cats touchdown that was that was a miscommunication at the line of scrimmage it looked like um, you know, there was an open path to the kicker. Not much the puncher could do there. It wasn't like he took his sweet time to kick that ball. Um, but then later in the game, of course, you have the offense. You have two really, you know, you need to make big plays uh, to win games. And and the the Tie Cats essentially made two big plays back to back with not only sh- you know strip sacking Zach Claros for a sixty two yard Chris Edwards touchdown, but then on the ensuing kickoff, obviously being able to to make that play to punch the ball out of, out of Janarian Grant's arms and then into the, uh, into the waiting hands of uh, Fraser Sopic, who brought it all the way down. If it wasn't for Johnny Augustine getting on his horse, I mean, he's, he's in the end zone. Of course he gets taken down at the two yard line and then James Butler shoves and uh, shoves another touchdown in. So I thought that was, that kind of left everybody with nine minutes remaining in the stadium, wondering uh, what's happening here. This was going to be a runaway, but I think you got to give credit to the bombers you know, to the Bombers, uh, you know, having a response. There were responses throughout that, even after the, even after the, um, you know, the, 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 the block punt for, for a, for a touchdown, the Bombers come back and they score, you know, that after the two, after those two big plays, I mean, the Bombers, I don't want to say they could have crumbled because this isn't a team that crumbles. I'm not surprised by, uh, by any means and how it, how it worked out. Um, but, you know, they managed to move the ball downfield, bring out Sergio Castillo for a massive 50-yard field goal, and that can't be understated. Look, if Mark Leggio was on this team, I'm telling you right now, given the way that the, the, uh, the kick coverage was playing all game long, essentially, there is absolutely no way. I, I will say this, that there's no way that Mike O'Shea would have trotted Mark Leggio out there for the 50-yard kick up eight points with with that much time left in the game. They would have relied on their defense. Instead, they bring out Sergio Castillo and, you know, like the like the sure thing he's proven to be while in Winnipeg, he knocks it right through the uprights and makes an 11-point game. So as much as it was a bit scary at the end, I imagine, for for Bomber fans, you know, this is, uh, this is the crazy football league for a reason. And the Bombers, you know, looked incredibly good for a week one for a week one team and uh and it's only going to build here I, i'm predicting as i wrote my my story for this morning that this team is going to go on a weeks long if not months long win streak um if they continue to execute the way they did in week one without guys like jackson jeffco for majority of the game and kenny Lawler for the entire game yeah hammer you know what it's a great point um about castillo um, and remo brought it up i mean it was four for four but the the placement and the situation in that game. I mean, that was a one score game at that point. I mean, if you don't make it, 
And you mentioned the kick coverage unit. I mean, there was a risk involved. It shows the confidence. And with the wind that was kind of all over the place, that was absolutely no gimme. And uh, he came up big and obviously a huge addition to have him back with the club. Um, the One of the new guys, though, that we talked a lot about was uh, Pigrome. And he actually mm-hmm. got stuffed a couple times on the goal line. I mean, we'll maybe get to what happened in Edmonton yesterday because you don't see that happen yeah. very often. Um but I'm sure that was something that, um, you know, Mike O'Shea and Buck Pierce will be looking at. And it was interesting that Drew Brown got in on short yardage later on in the game after that happened. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that's not their short yard package anymore with Tyrell Pigram. I, I get it's just one game, but, um, you know, it's interesting, right? Because I don't think you, you know, there's arguments to be made that you need, you know, if you're a big body, you can drive easily. If you're a smaller body, you can decoy um, you know, find those little holes that, a, you know, an otherwise bigger, bigger player wouldn't be able to find um, just to get that yard or two, right? Tyrell Pigram is, is a bit of an interesting body type. He's not a big guy by any means at 5'10", so he's not like this towering 6'4 quarterback that's going to put his head down and drive in, but he's also not a Drew Brown either. Like, he's, he's a stocky, bigger guy, right? I mean, we saw that in the preseason um, where he was trucking over DBs and, and you know, finding those extra layers of the defense to get through, right? And so, I think that might be the that might be the challenge with this team. Like, is is this guy truly a short yardage guy, like a Dakota Prukop, or a you know a guy who you know is a bit stronger of an? I don't want to say a better athlete because Tyler Pligram is a good athlete, um, but you know maybe he's not the right guy for short yardage, or maybe he's not the right guy for the short yardage in which they're setting him up to be. Like, you know, can you imagine that? Imagine that guy just took a snap from the even from shotgun. You don't think he's getting the first yard? I mean, he was doing that all preseason long. But um, you know, in, in that event, I mean, the fact that Drew Brown came in um, for a short yardage play, executed it. I would not be surprised if Drew Brown, you know, moving forward was that short yardage guy. But what does that mean for Tyler Pringle? I also wouldn't be surprised if they give him another chance. You know, Michael Shea isn't one to necessarily take one week into consideration and you know make a you know a definitive conclusion on something right I mean Mark Leggio is a perfect example of that I mean he's had some good weekends some bad weekends so um, but that wasn't that that did turn out to be an you know important part of the game as you mentioned with the one score game late uh, you know it would have been nice to pad that score I mean they were able to get you know the safety followed by a, a you know an extra three points so it wasn't that big of a difference in margin but um, at the same time, you know, you, you got to be executing those plays. The, the Bombers have been, you know, near perfect in, in short yardage situations with, with Dakota Prukup and obviously Chris Strebler before that. Um, they can't be going into this season, you know, with a lot, a lot riding on the year, not being able to execute those short, just those third and short situations. Hey, uh, just we'll speak in a third and short quickly. Uh, what did you think of uh, the Sunday Nighter last night? I mean, the Elks, great crowd. <laughs> Listen, they worked so hard to get people into the stadium. They had these guaranteed win section seats where people come back if they didn't win. Saskatchewan wasn't particularly good. It's the fourth quarter. You got the ball first and goal on the one. That has to go in. And uh, I wasn't very creative from an offensive standpoint. They just did the same damn thing three times, and it didn't work on any of the occasions. Well, and Kay Loxley is a short yardage kind of quarterback, is a mobile quarterback, right? And so for him to try up the gut twice and then, and then whoa, let's throw a real wrinkle on them and try the left side just briefly and, and to get stuck there. I mean, that that is uh, when it rains, it pours in Elks, in Elks land right now. And I mean, when you, when you consider that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have won two great cups since the Elks last won a game on home turf, I mean, that's got to be a got to be a tough pill to swallow and we certainly <laughs> saw that in the post game i mean right tsn's ryan rashog asked chris jones about that and you know he you know, he comes out there and it's so funny right because he spends the training all training camp buttering up to reporters seeming like this really nice guy and you know he does even does a chris jones jones mean tweets which i think you which know, was hilarious which was hilarious i mean they could have taken the real mean tweets there's a quite there's a quite you know they took the pg-13 one which are which which is which is important but um, anyways, you know, for him to tell, to tell, you know, Rashog that that was the worst question someone could ask and that there were other parts of the game, um, that, you know, that, that played a factor in the loss. Like I, you know, he was both incredibly wrong and incredibly right at the same time. Like, you know, he incredibly wrong in the sense like, yeah, we, you don't have to pin it on the short, 
you know, the, the, the three attempts at the goal line, you can look at the fact that you're trying to, you're trying to pretend you're the smartest guy in the CFL and you're bringing in a guy like Taylor Cornelius as your quarterback thinking that this guy is going to be some star player as lo- so long as you surround him with great pieces. I mean, that didn't work last year with, when you when you paid Kenny Lawler 300 and, so- and something thousand dollars to come over there. You, you know, I get it. You bring in you bring in Geno Lewis, you bring in Dunbar Jr., you already have a handful of other strong guys. You got a good running game, you know. Your quarterback is the most important part of your of your team. And so and, and like you said, I mean, those kind of comments like even Victor Kui, the president, you know, he's done a lot of great you know, a lot of great things for this organization has brought it, uh, you know, an energy that is needed at, at, in this league and, and a passion that is needed for it to be a successful team. But even he goes out on Twitter afterwards and starts going, you know, uh, you know, we know the new, you know, I, I'm, I'm predicting the new spin tomorrow is going to be a focus on the on the uh, the losing streak. But I'm going to thank the 32,000 fans that showed up, whatever. Both can be true. You're the one who built an entire ticket sales campaign on winning a game at home and now you're coming out on social media and pretending that there's going to be a spin there's no spin to the fact that you have the 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 longest losing streak at home in sports history like that of course everyone's going to be talking about that win a game at home that's what you want to fill seats in the stadium win at home that's what you need to do but um you know that's just it's just that's the best part about the cfl man wild storylines week in and week out and why we why we watch the games and cover them with such exuberance is because this is just a crazy league and sunday was just another example well and uh and just before we flip over to the jet stuff um got a battle of undefeated one and oh one and oh bombers riders week two i'll be honest i didn't even realize that we were playing the bombers until like late last night they said oh and the saskatchewan's hosting winnipeg i'm like wait wait a second what First usually road i just think of labor day and the banjo bowl but um uh, it'll be a hell of an atmosphere i'm sure for a rider home opener i think that win should hopefully get some of the fans um behind them a little bit more obviously it was a pretty rough off season for saskatchewan um, but they're going to need to bring their A game and be a lot better than they were against Edmonton if they want to beat the uh, defending uh, Western champions. Well, and that's the thing about week one in that game between Edmonton and Saskatchewan, right? Because Edmonton wins that game, it's good for the CFL. Look, you snap this super long home losing streak, that narrative is over, but then the narrative of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders continues, right? This this coaching staff and management is on a short leash, so to fall at you know on the road to Edmonton the first week and then have Winnipeg show up at home the second week and what's going to be a tough battle for Saskatchewan to win that would have been tough at at 0 and 2 after 2 weeks you know the fan base wouldn't be happy the franchise would be headed in the wrong direction and you know it would just kind of risk things being off the rails but there you know there they were i mean Trevor Harris hopefully he's okay i know he got banged up you know later later in that game but um, you know, they weren't all that special either, right? It was two teams that were trying to kind of work out the kinks. And, you know, I, like I said earlier in the interview, I, I don't like to make definitive statements, but you look at some, you, you know, you look at the East right now and, and you're wondering, are we, are we deja vuing from, from what's been seemingly year after year after year? Like Ottawa and Montreal both didn't look good. It, like, you know, it, it became a race of who wanted to win that game and both were trying their darndest not to. And, um, you know, at the end, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you look at the Bombers and, and you know, as I mentioned, the continuity and, and the dominance they had really from really from the first few minutes of the game. We didn't really see any team take over in, in that kind of fashion throughout the weekend. So it bodes well for Winnipeg, for sure. Um, that's going to be a, a, an interesting clash. Um, it's always going to be a spirited one. But uh, certainly whenever it's played in uh, in Ryderville, um, the Bombers always seem to to leave that game, uh, you know, feeling like feeling pretty good about themselves. We'll say that. All right, Jeff Hamilton's with us. Bombers and Riders Friday night in Saskatchewan. And then uh, the Bombers are back home Thursday, June 22nd against the BC Lions. Um, There's never a dull day around the NHL offseason right now, at least as it pertains to the Winnipeg Jets. Of course, last week it was all about Pierre-Luc Dubois, who reiterated his demand for a trade, or I guess his agent did. But there was some developments that, you know, reported in The Athletic that they're willing to sign and do a sign and trade, that they're going to give a list of five to six teams. I think that was a real positive for the Jets, just as opposed to it's Montreal or nothing and figure it out. Uh, And then the weekend came and another report from The Athletic saying uh, that ship has sailed as it pertains to the possibility of Connor Hellebuck's next contract being with the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, 
what were what 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 have you made of the last seven days or so, Jeff, since we've spoken and the reports coming out specifically amongst the two guys, the Jets, I think feel they're being sort of forced to trade as opposed to the ones that they are looking to move. Yeah, I think the Jets would probably wish the media took it easy on them for the uh, the number of reports coming out, right? Because I think they're in a real situation here where, you know, obviously this team, when they, you know, we talked about this for weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months, about, about what the future looks like for this club. But if you have guys like Josh Morrissey, if you had guys like Nikolai Ehlers and Kyle Connor and, you know, Adam Lowry, you know, guys who are important pieces to your team that are that are under contract for for at least a, f- a couple or a few more years. Um, how can you really, you know, rebuild? And you know, and and the and the, if the intention is to retool. You know, how did what does that look like? And and mm-hmm. can you keep can can you manage to keep any of the pieces? And we'll call them the big three, or or the uh, you know the overall four. I call them Blake Wheeler, obviously being the fourth in that group. Um, you know, how, what, what if any of those pieces could come back, right? I mean, we, we've heard, we've heard, you know, news generated about the Winnipeg Jets wanting to sign Pierre-Luc Dubois to a long-term deal, right? Wanting to build their team around him. Well, that, that, that was clearly wishful thinking and, you know, uh, maybe a message to the fan base, like, look, we're trying, we, we, you know, we want this guy here. We traded, you know, we traded us, you know, a potential superstar and, in Patrick Liney for his services. We don't just want to give him up. We're going to do everything we can. Well, I think that kind of hit a, you know, I, I, I would imagine the Jets are pretty frustrated with Pierre-Luc Dubois um, and, and all this. I mean, yeah, it might seem nice that he's, he's willing to, he's willing to work with the Winnipeg Jets to get out of town and, and sign a deal with it, with the team. You know, we've seen the Jets play hardball in the past before in these kind of situations, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's, um, there's lots of, there's lots of, I don't want to say there's lots of different ways they could deal with this, but um, I think that, that when you look at the, you know, if, you know, I think Mark Shifley will probably be the next guy to be announced that he's moving on. From what I understand, Mark Shifley met with the team this past week uh, to go over his future. Um, you know, I, that would include talking with probably Mark Chipman, obviously, and, and Kevin Shevelday off. I mean, with all with this news kind of coming out, I think it's only a matter of time until Mark Shifley says he's moving on or, or hopes to move on. And, you know, we've seen the Jets facilitate trades quietly. We saw them facilitate a trade with Jake you know, Jacob Truba for the most part, quietly. I know that did get public at certain points, but prior to that kind of public, you know, um, talk from his agent wanting to move and all those things, uh, you know, they were working with him to, to move him. But, you know, while it all seems like doom and gloom for the Winnipeg Jets with, with these three players, I think this is actually a really good thing for their future. I don't think any th- any of the three of those guys, Connor Hellebuck, Mark Shifley, uh, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, and we'll throw in Blake Wheeler, were should or could be part of their future, right? I mean, all those guys have kind of, you know, look at look at Pierre Dubois. I mean, that guy had one great year with the Winnipeg Jets, and last year was pretty good, but we kind of saw his true colors by the end of the season, right? We saw a guy that was giving up on the team, wasn't giving it his all, probably was playing through injury, and that's what I think is the most interesting about about Pierre Dubois. Is I'd be curious to know what his health status is and what what the results of his uh, his physical were at the end of the season, because there might be some interesting information out of that. Um, but then you look at, you know, Mark Shifley, who's been here for a long time. Is this a guy who's ready to sign another long-term deal? Do you want him to be the leader, you know, by signing him to a, you know, another six, seven, eight year deal, he's now going to be the face of your franchise for, you know, the new era that we're moving into. So I don't think you want that. And then there's the, and then there's uh, you know, of course, Connor Hellebuck who wants to be with a contender. He's a guy who, and I've said this on your show for a very long time, I think he was going to be the toughest guy to convince, you know, with a young family, with an opportunity to set up roots. We know, you know, you know, he's, he's from the U S we know that a lot of U S born players like to play in the U S and I thought that Hellbuck was always going to be the toughest, toughest guy to resign. And particularly with his exit interview, when he, when he, when he said what everybody has been thinking that made, you know, individually, there's a lot of talent with this group, but collectively the success just hasn't been there. So, you know, anyways, my back to my original point about the, the jets taking an opportunity here, you know, go do your research. This, this, this team has a, you know, has, has hockey minds that go beyond, you know, Kevin shovel day off a scouting staff that is smart and intelligent and understands and knows prospects, identify those prospects and go trade those three guys for good packages. That's where you, that's where you earn your paycheck is, is finding those guys who are going to be ready in a year, two years time and get the job done. You want to retool. No one is expecting the Winnipeg jets 
to with those three guys or without those three guys to be some kind of Stanley Cup contender next season. There's not a single person who thinks that. But that doesn't mean this team can't be really good with the right players in two, one, two, three years' time with the right trades for these guys. Heck, go out and get first-round picks for those three guys. Why, why can't Connor Hellebuck warrant a first-round pick you know, next year, if you can get and, and it, you have to be willing to maybe throw some pieces in there, because I'm not saying that necessarily, you know, one year left on a contract warrants a top 15 pick. But if you can look at the teams in the top 15, I'm looking at Montreal. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at uh, the Philadelphia Flyers. I'm looking at Detroit Red Wings. Go find go find trades where you can get maybe three picks, two picks in the top 15, and you might be setting yourself up with two, three players that will be ready in two years' time. That's how deep this draft is. There's a little bit of a belief out there that this is a draft that you can find massive players in the first, second, third round. I've talked to a fair amount of scouts that don't actually believe that. It's very, very top-heavy where it seems like the top 15, 17 players in this draft are going to be NHL-ready sooner than later. That's where this draft gets special. So if you're the Jets scouting staff, and I think this is probably where they're headed with the difficulties of, re- of being able to of trade for actual players because nobody wants to give you the caliber of player back that you're giving them because why would like, – other than having the similar contract status or the same kind of distru- disgruntled issues, how are you going to get a, 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 a player back like the player you're giving up in a Connor Hellebuck uh, – Mark Scheifele or Pierre-Luc Dubois, find young talent, get those picks and do your jobs and develop a team that you can be proud of in two, three years time. And you're not going through a five year, six year, seven year rebuild. Well, the other thing about moving those players in is regardless of what comes back, whether it is more on the future side of things, which I don't think will be, I think it'll be a combination of both. You do need some bodies in here. The absence, particularly of Shifley and Wheeler, but also Dubois, allows for new players to come in and take those roles. But what it also does is give Rick Bonus far more of a clean sheet to really, truly establish the culture. And really, this goes for Sheffield Dayoff, Chipman, everyone, to move on from what the culture of the Winnipeg Jets had become and start it going in a different direction focusing on new players, new voices, new individuals. And it is clear that that is is as important as almost anything right now with this team. Because long-term, I mean, look at the two teams that are playing right now. And listen, Maurice went in to a situation where there was a pretty good talkie team already. They made a significant trade where they brought in Matthew Kachuk, who is absolutely a franchise player and is sort of the heartbeat of that team and the way they've responded to their challenges throughout the year. And you look at the Vegas Golden Knights, who really are top to bottom, and I mean, they're just about to be, I assume, crowned champions of the National Hockey League, and they'll deserve every bit of it, both from the head coach, from the general manager, but every one of those players. And and they've taken, a, both of those teams have taken very aggressive swings. Now, they're also in no-tax areas, and everyone seems to want to play there, so you know they have some advantages built in. Some of those advantages that no matter what happens, Winnipeg won't have. But the identity of those teams, the way that they play, the way that they play together for each other, which we've heard a lot here in Winnipeg in the past, that just obviously wasn't the case. And all you need to do is look at how that series ended against Vegas. That is what they, that is what, where they need to get to. And I think to your point, Jeff, as much as we'll see what happens on the individual trades and what ends up coming back to the Winnipeg Jets, we're talking about an opportunity to really move on from a particular era that got pretty stale and frankly somewhat cantankerous and move it on to another area that, um, you know, whether it's this year or not, can be a step in the right direction for a team that still does have a lot of talent in the locker room. To be honest with you, I don't think anybody on the Winnipeg Jets should be protected in building a new era, you know? And, and I mean, I know it sounds kind of wild and crazy um, and I'm not advocating for like trading, you know, someone like a Josh Morrissey per se or something like that, but other teams are going to be calling about those players. They're going to be calling about the Kyle Connors. They're going to be calling about the Josh Morrisseys. And I think at the very least you need to be listening. Well, if it makes you better, 
Sure. That's what that absolutely. And that, and that's what I mean. I mean, it, and I'm not, again, I'm not advocating that you trade those players, but you need to identify, you know, what, what, what kind of identity you want to have, because that's been the biggest problem with this team. They haven't had an identity for years. They they haven't lacked talent, but they have certainly lacked identity and, 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 you know, finding the right players under the right system. I mean, what's to say if, you know, with the, with the, with the assets that the jets have, the top end assets that the jets have that they couldn't, mm-hmm. Do their research. Go out there and ask for team's top prospects. Play hard. You know, these are good players that you're giving away. And build, you know, and this isn't even building the covers. Ask for top mm. prospects and and find, you know, find a, a solution over the next few years. Well, it, never mind know. top prospect. I mean, we just heard Elliot Friedman. We played it at the start talking about, you know, that the Kings were looking to prepare a big run at Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, and where does that leave Quentin Byfield? I mean, Byfield's the right. exact guy that I've been talking about for two months saying, you know what, if you could work out a player like that that hasn't popped yet, that comes in, hey, he was a number two overall pick too. We're talking about highly ranked drafted players. It's taken a little bit longer for Byfield, but I mean, to me, that's the sort of player, if you can get him out of L.A., that, you know, makes sense to get to a new uh, new spot and, and uh, give, them, of, give that chance to actually be a top six player and, and show it. Speaking of L.A., I bet you they put a package for all three of those players. Connor Halbuck, Mark Scheifele, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, and they take the best one. I like they, yeah. they, they have been linked, the, the Kings have been linked to all three of those players. I've talked to, you know, advisors, scouts in the past, and they, why not, why not put in a big package of Connor Hellebuck and Pierre-Luc Dubois? Well, you know what I mean? like, what, if and, that's the case, if that's the case, then uh, I feel definitely in that package and probably Dursey and a couple other guys too. Exactly. Maybe a picker as well, although I guess that pick has been traded already. Hammer, listen, great stuff. Um, let's check in uh, later on this week and uh, look forward to talking to you next week and seeing what uh, happens with the Bombers in Saskatchewan. Thanks for doing this. Hey, to think we were just getting started too, Huss. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, and shout out to the commenters. You guys make the show. You know how it is. Right on. There's Jeff Hamilton from the Winnipeg Free Press. We are going to be talking about that historic win at Oakdale yesterday for Nick Taylor and Canadian Golf. Just before we get to Adam Scully, a big shout out to everyone that came out to the Princess Auto tailgate zone before the Bomber game on Friday. Great to see everyone, and thanks for the kind words that you're enjoying Winnipeg sports talk. Always great to see uh, princess auto. will be firing it up again before the game next uh, thir- a week, Thursday against the BC lions. Come early. Great deals on food, drink, beers, hot dogs, and more. Of course, princess auto proud sponsor of the bombers and where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at princess auto uh, our friends at consolidated supply are busy right now as they're the leaders in irrigation systems artificial turf new and used golf carts not to mention other great options for your property including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchen options and of course they're the go-to guys for small engine parts and repair pop by consolidated supply and see them today at their showroom open to the public 1395 niaqua road east or find out more online at the new website at cte.ca. Wow, was that a massive tent sale over at Royal Sports on the weekend. Thousands of pairs of shoes, merch, equipment, and more, all at 50% off or more. I know there'll be another tent sale or two later on this summer, so keep your eyes peeled for that by following them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pamina. Uh, but right now, all that great new bomber gear is waiting for you. Certainly Jets gear, but you might want to see who's left before you go get your number on a jersey <clears throat> from the squad. And spring stock arriving daily with soccer, baseball, softball, tennis equipment, disc golf, and so much more, not to mention a huge selections of bikes. Pop by and see them. Royal Sports, Manitoba's number one sports superstore, 750 Pembina Highway. And just before we talk some golf, if you're looking for a great spot to watch the game tonight, NBA Finals, or tomorrow, maybe the cup gets presented, no better place to do that than your local Boston Pizza get together with friends for the big game at your local BP and enjoy ice cold schooners, world famous BP wings and gourmet pizzas and the latest from the BP feature menu. If you're staying in, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right. The story of the weekend in Canadian sports and maybe sports in general, considering the way the week started was actually happening on the golf course at Oakdale and it is a real pleasure to welcome in Adam Scully from Golf Talk Canada and TSN Sports Center 
to talk about the historic win of Winnipeg-born Nick Taylor. Adam, what's up? It's great to have you on the program. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, and what a performance it was by Nick Taylor. Uh, I mean, first of all, you guys, we had Z, uh, Z-Man on uh, earlier this week. He's one of our favorites, and... Um, you know, talking about, you know, it was just sort of like the way the week started. It was like the Canadian Open got hijacked again. This time, though, maybe by the biggest story in the history of the sport, to be perfectly honest. Certainly that hasn't happened on a golf course. You were there the whole time. I mean, what was it like there at the start? And by the way, that clip of you producing and why reading the news as it happened in the middle of Bob and Mark doing their thing. I, I think spoke. It was a perfect moment. I watched it a bunch of times because I think we were all were like that. What the hell? Yeah, it, that that's basically what was going through my mind. What was that? And uh, it was Mark and I hosting th- that day. You're watching the video there, and, and we had a guest. Golf about uh, about the tournament itself. It was this picker driving range uh, gizmo that that's now been put out by a great guy Jim Clark. And I'm reading this news and I'm thinking this this can't be real, right? 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 No, I was wrong. So that was actually legitimate news. It all went down, and of course we were live on the air when it happened, which made it uh, even funnier. But throughout that Tuesday, that was just bonkers to say the least. I was waiting outside the clubhouse during uh, to wait for uh, the players to leave that players only meeting on that Friday on that Tuesday afternoon at about four o'clock and uh, as the players were leaving that meeting to say they were unhappy would be an understatement Uh, the amount of times I I received a no to be quickly interviewed was pretty funny Uh, I had heard a couple of pretty uh, pretty funny responses most notably from Tyrrell Hatton who finished one shot out of a playoff this past week who gave me the most emphatic nope when I asked him if I, if uh, he wanted to speak uh, to me after. And, and Kashmir Keith Mitchell, got to give him a shout-out too. I asked him if he wanted to be interviewed, and he looked at me. He looked right through me and then keep, kept walking. So that was quite fun. <laughs> Kashmir Keith, what a great nickname. Um, then they got onto the course. And first of all, I mean, just because we're going to really focus on Nick Taylor and what this means, I want to ask you about the golf course because – Oakdale had never hosted this event before. It was a little shorter than most, and a lot of people thought that this would just be eaten up. But certainly, especially early on, the course actually held its own against the uh, the best of the PGA Tour. Yeah, for the most part. Now, if we had received temperatures this past weekend that we uh, had received the previous weekend in the GTA when it was around 30 degrees Celsius and not too windy, I think the I think the scores would have been a little lower. We would have seen sort of in the mid twenties, I think, because it was just hotter. The ball was going a long way. But this past weekend, we saw a lot of rain. We saw or a decent amount of rain, I should say. More wind. It was challenging conditions. More of a swirly wind uh, as well, which made things very challenging on the player, especially that Friday morning. That draw of the players who went out late and then early for Thursday and Friday during the first and second rounds, they got the bad portion of the draw because it was certainly challenging to say the least and the big defense of the golf course oakdale was the greens because not very big very undulating very slopey and a lot of uphill approach shots now it wasn't all that long like you mentioned but if you if your spin control wasn't sharp with your wedges you had no chance to keep the ball close to the hole to to be putting from below the hole a la v or a case in point rory mcelroy who another curious sunday to, to say the least but uh all in all oakdale i i thought it was a lot better than people had thought i mean that at that 18th hole uh on the saturday during the, the cbs portion of the broadcast i heard the term quirky about 12 times but we saw it being played time after time after time and it's a risk reward hole and we saw one of the great moments in canadian sports history on the hole so all in all i, I actually don't hate the hole anymore <laughs> It's just weird seeing guys pull five iron on the tee on a par five. That's not normally what we're seeing. I guess that kind of made it to the cork. Um, Heading into the tournament, this is huge for all the Canadian players. This is not new to this year, but uh, how much, how heavy was the burden of the questions over and over again about 1954 and how long it had been since a Canadian had won this tournament? 
Oh, definitely heavy. And, you know, Graham Dillette was on our show throughout the week while we were at the rink hole at the RBC Canadian Open. Of course, he's now a retired PGA Tour player and a TSN golf analyst. And he spoke at length about the pressure that he felt personally when he was playing. And now it was even more because all the talk heading into last week of the RBC Canadian Open, merger aside, of course, was all these top Canadians playing a lot of great golf. We'd already seen wins during the fall portion of the PGA Tour schedule from Mackenzie Hughes, from Adam Svensson. Corey Connors wins the week before the Masters at the Valero Texas Open. And Nick Taylor had had a great season prior to this past week with four top tens pair of runner-up finishes been playing some great golf made some subtle adjustments to his putter we saw that sort of saw grip that he was using so these players have been been facing these questions for quite some time and we saw nick taylor throughout that final round that demeanor not getting too high or too low that even keeledness if you will really paid off in the end you know after saturday i was so geeked to watch it on sunday and really the entire day not just you know the last few holes because when you looked at that leaderboard i mean i guess ct pan had a bit of a lead a couple strokes but i mean there was about a dozen guys basically at 12 11 or 10 and some pretty big names i mean most of the big names that were at the tournament were right there in the mix on sunday but then there was some attrition some guys fell off including rory mcelroy who couldn't buy a birdie for the the life of him and then it comes down to Tommy Fleetwood and, of course, Nick Taylor. Uh, but Tyrrell Hatton, first of all, dropped that 64 coming away from the pack and is in the clubhouse at 16. And you knew, okay, well, 16 is the number that you have to get to. But then when Nick – well, let's start off with Nick's putt on 18, the little sidewinder popping in to get to 17. Uh, the way that he came back from that bogey on 16 – was incredible back-to-back birdies. That was a moment already that I think people thought might stand up as an all-time Canadian golf moment. Um, Nick Taylor's performance on Sunday, starting off maybe where he won it in the first few holes that were playing the toughest, and he was the one that was getting birdies. Yeah, he certainly was. Got off to, to that great start, then sort of held on some notable shots early in his back nine, that 12th hole, the par five, when he hit this sort of sawed off fairway metal from the rough that seemed to scoot on for call it 60, 70, 80 yards. Sure. He just missed the Eagle putt, but the way he bounced back, like you mentioned, he made a bogey uh, late in his back nine, but you, you love that 72nd hole, that dicey up and down from above the hole. A lot of talk about whether he should have taken a drop because he was basically standing right on a sprinkler head. He must have liked the lie well enough or good enough to, to play that shot. And he played this little dribbler that finished probably eight feet above the hole. And the thing I like the most about Nick Taylor's putt for birdie on the 72nd hole, he was fist pumping before the ball had even dropped. He knew it. Talk about swagger right there from Nick Taylor. That's the first thing I noticed. It was an unbelievable performance just to make it into a play. Well, then he went to the range, and, uh, you know, it was waiting time. And and I will say this. I mentioned this at the start of the show. Full disclosure, I had a Tommy Fleetwood ticket at 25 to 1. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going, okay, this is either going to be very lucrative financially or I'm going to witness the greatest moment since Mike Weir won the Masters for Canadian golf. Um, when Tommy Fleetwood got to 17 and then had to play the 18th hole, I kind of thought it was over. I thought that, well, Nick had his moment. It was incredible. But it's going to be just one stroke short. Um, Tommy's had an issue winning on the PGA Tour. And uh, that was, I mean, he had that in regulation and then a couple putts i mean i have a feeling this one might haunt him for a little bit you know what it's funny you mention that because on our show golf talk canada we make tsn edge picks every week where mark bob and i we all pick three players uh and and take a look for that week generally we have a long shot value pick too and weeksy gotta give him credit he had nick taylor that was Whoa! his third pick yeah baby at 70 to one now if if we had done it again 
Nick Taylor was 500 to one heading into the weekend. So imagine someone who jumped on that pony. But, you know, it's funny. So you mentioned Fleetwood because he was on my team as well. I, I was all over Tommy Fleetwood heading into the week. I watched him practice early on Monday at Oakdale. I thought it was his time. But uh, like you mentioned, that 18th hole, he had birdied it the first three days. All he had to do really hit the fairway off the tee. And that's not a sure thing you're making birdie, but you've got a pretty darn good chance. And of course, he missed it right in the right rough. But the layup, that was such a puzzling play. And I, I think if you were to do it again, or if you were to do it again, hindsight, of course, obviously, is 2020. From 254, you'd hit a five wood, try to hit it somewhere around the green, and then try to pitch it from. 20 yards or so anywhere near the hole. Instead, he's got the 78 foot wedge shot with the ball way below his feet. He had a really good shot from a thick lie to 45 feet and had a dicey little two putt, which of course he did. But for Tommy Fleetwood, sure, he's had success on the DP World Tour, but never won on American soil, which is puzzling to say the least. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, but then it was time for the playoff. And uh, we mentioned Tommy had a couple putts on two and three that didn't go in for him. Uh, they both birdied at once. Um, and then there's Nick Taylor, 72 feet away. Um, just take us through your memory of the scene on 18 reaction to the putt. And then obviously everything that happened afterwards, including Adam Hadwin getting taken out by Terry Tate, who is uh went from office linebacker to uh, security guard on the 18th hole. I mean, a scene that no one will ever forget. A scene that, that no one will ever forget, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of people who were right there, right then and there. I, I unfortunately was not. I was hosting SportsCenter last night, so I was sitting in, in our newsroom when, when it all went down, and it sounded like, it, you know, a volcano erupted when it when <laughs> On that phone and in our newsroom, but for uh, for uh, for Nick Taylor, the way to go down. Talking with Mark Zacchino, who now had that iconic call, which has absolutely gone viral on ESPN Golf Channel, the works down in the states. You know, I, I, he was describing how he was trying to kneel over like a catcher and have people look over him to try to to try to see it. And you know, with all with Lawrence uh, Golf Canada CEO Lawrence Applebaum, RBC Canadian Open Tournament Director Brian Crawford. We saw the Canadians, of course, who were there with Connors, with Adam Hadwin, you know, those European guys, of course, who were there too, with Justin Rose and Tyrrell Hatton and Shane Lowry and Lowry's caddy uh, as well. It was, it was quite a scene. And, and you mentioned Adam Hadwin and I spoke to uh, tournament director, Brian Crawford at our show, Golf Talk Canada this morning, who, and Brian Crawford played for the Toronto Argonauts. And he said, he's never seen anyone get tackled that hard period. So I, I thought that was pretty funny. And if you haven't seen it yet, go check out Twitter because about 20 minutes ago, Adam Hadwin put out a tweet where the USGA has put in his players locker, a hard hat. So, so he can be prepared and be ready for this week. It's, it's pretty good stuff. There, I mean, there were so many videos of it earlier, but the one that came out afterwards, that 4K shot from the sidelines oh. is, I mean, to say it's art is an understatement. I mean, <laughs> something that will just live in, live in forever. So let me ask you this, Adam. You spend so much time talking golf with the fellows on Golf Talk Canada. Um, where does this rank among Canadian golf moments and... Um, you know, is it an overstatement to say this is a moment that's right up there, at least in the mix with one of the most important and awesome Canadian sports moments ever? I mean, I'm biased because I work in golf, so I, I would definitely say yes, it's up there. In, in the Canadian sports moments, you know, I, I heard people talking in the press center on Sunday night comparing this to the Golden Goal by Sidney Crosby back in 2010. Now, those who don't follow golf as closely might disagree with that. And sure, they, everyone can have their own opinion. But in terms of golf itself, there's really three moments now. There's Mike Weir in 2003 winning the Masters. There's Brooke Henderson in 2018 winning the Women's Open in the Saskatchewan area. And there's Nick Taylor pulling it from 72 feet to win on Canadian soil, breaking that 69-year drought. I, I, I'd say all three would. You'd have to have a real good debate and discussion. But all in all, all three of these moments in terms of Canadian golf, such a huge impact, not only on today, but in the future. Because, hey, if Mike Weir doesn't, doesn't win the Masters in 03, maybe Nick Taylor isn't playing golf. Maybe he, he isn't inspired to go out there 
and, and try to play the game professionally. And after that victory on Sunday at the Canadian Open, who knows? I think Nick Taylor will definitely have a lot of youngsters trying to go out and be the next Nick Taylor and go on to play golf. Well, and you know what, Adam, just while we're talking about Canadian golf and lost in this, I mean, Derek Ingram's a great friend of ours here in Winnipeg. He's had such a hand in so many of these young players as, you know, juniors and then moving through Golf Canada programs now on the tour. I mean, dude, we're midway through June and there's been four different winners with a Canadian passport on tour. I if you had told me that was even possible 10 years ago, I would have laughed you out of the room. Yeah, you know, you're right about that. And uh, I love the shout out to Derek Ingram. I got to spend some time with him a couple of weeks ago, too. And he was on our show last week. He's an absolute beauty. But, you know, you mentioned the, the, the four uh, victories on the PGA Tour. Of course, Brooke Henderson on the LPGA Tour. Ben Silverman, Corn Ferry Tour. Stephen Ames, three victories on PGA Tour champions. Seven Canadians playing this week at the U.S. Open, the most since 2008. There is Canadian golf is in an absolutely unbelievable time right now. I can't wait to see what's coming here in the summer. And I can't wait to see what's coming this week. What are we going to do for an encore at LACC? How amazing would it be to see another red flag up and in the mix this week? Well, I won't nail you for a pick for the tournament, but I will ask you this. Who do you have as your top Canadian at LACC? at the U.S. Open, and uh, hopefully that coincides with the winner as well. Yeah, that would definitely be something special. I mean, it's he, he's been in the news a lot in the last 18 hours or so, but Adam Hadwin, I, I really believe he's playing some great golf. He's got to be motivated by all these guys. Hopefully he's not too sore given the, the walloping and the airtime his rear end got after that absolutely insane tackle. But this is a guy who has made the International President's Cup team twice and you got to think yesterday when he saw mike weir and you know mike weir went viral for basically swearing on, on the air which is pretty funny at, at that and, and and with that uh, tall can with him too which i absolutely loved when weirzy was just taken down that sapporo but anyway for adam hadwin you got to think he's motivated he's had a good season too he went through some swing changes a couple years ago came top 10 at the u.s open as well last year i think adam hadwin is primed to have a good week here at lacc but six other guys and all seven players who are from canada have a, a really legitimate shot to contend this week oh just quickly who are the seven and is nick obviously in it and, and by the way he's now i guess nick had won before so he's played the masters in the past nick taylor has played the masters so he actually played the the november 2020 masters so, uh, but obviously he will be there uh, again uh, this week. I'm just trying to pull the list up here. I had it right beside me of the player of the Canadians who are in uh, the U.S. Open. Taylor Pendrith was the last one to qualify this past Monday. So we got Taylor Pendrith, Roger Sloan, Adam Hadwin, Mackenzie Hughes, Adam Spence, and Corey Connors, Nick Taylor. So a quick seven. What a squad. Spot. What a squad we got going to L.A. Yeah, what a squad we got there. And, you know, we've seen in the past, where, whether it's the Players' Championship or the Masters, where there's a foursome of Canadians going out during a practice round. Not sure if LACC is going to be cool with a quick sevensome heading out there. Pace of play might not be amazing, but a foursome and a threesome with a bunch of, you know, Canadian media and such following in between for a practice round. It's bound to be a great week. And I'm, I'm not sure about you, but I love golf in prime time oh whether, you know it's, it's just the absolute best right and we're in june coverage goes to like 11 o'clock at night on friday sign me up uh it is going to be a phenomenal and speaking of the masters next year i mean they might need a bigger group um before because i mean mike weir's going to be there you got four winners i mean that'd be cool I, I don't know if they let you play fives at augusta but uh, i guess we'll uh, we'll see adam Great stuff. Great work on Sports Center too, by the way. I always enjoy seeing you uh, jump on uh, that show. But shout out to the great work you guys did. It was a huge week for golf in Canada and a great week for Golf Talk Canada and uh, fans of the show. Appreciate you doing this. Hey, thanks. Anytime. And I'm happy to join whenever you want. Good stuff. There's Adam Scully of TSN and Golf Talk Canada. Z-Man is going to join us tomorrow from L.A. We'll kind of do a little combo. He can give us his thoughts. We'll play the call a little bit and... Uh, then we'll get his thoughts on what's to come because we got a major coming up this week. But great stuff from uh, from Adam Scully. Um, all right. Hey, uh, I'm going to give a shout-out to Dallas Pauls. I think Dallas is here right now. Loyal listener. 
of WST. I somehow missed him at the game, the fish game on Saturday. But uh, I saw Dallas <clears throat> on Twitter, grabbed a beer bat of some of that great little brown jug brew. Little brown jug was actually in Craft Beer Corner and is right now. They had the queer beer and the uh, golden ale. There's, there's our guy Dallas rocking the WST merch. It doesn't get much better than that. Appreciate the support. But uh, there's a lot of people enjoying the little brown jugs there. And, of course, you can get the what they have on tap at Craft Beer Corner. But what I love about uh, the Gold Ice Games is uh, it's got the generic lager in cans available as well. So uh, whether you had a 1919 at the Bomber game on the weekend or a generic or one of the tap beers on uh, Saturday, Little Brown Jug well represented for our local teams right now. Of course, um, going to be another great week. If you haven't been down to the brewery and tap room, check out their great patio and try all the great Little Brown Jug offerings down on William Avenue. Pick it up at your local beer store or shop online with local delivery at littlebrownjug.ca. I was just talking to our friend Pitt Turan out at Aikens Lake on the weekend. Holy smokes, they've had a great start to the season. Looking forward to getting there in a month or two. Uh, if you're thinking about an amazing fly-in fishing experience with world-class fishing and even more world-class hospitality, check out what the Aikens experience is all about Go to AikensLake.com for more information or hit them up on Twitter at Aikens Lake and find out more about what Aikens has awaiting you as well as available dates remaining this year or plan to make a visit to Aikens next year. Again, AikensLake.com. And, uh, of course, we just did our golf report with uh, Adam Scully. Big shout-out to our friends at Breezy Bend, uh, our partners in all things golf, and another huge golf week coming up because it is U.S. Open Week in L.A. And um, we're going to have Z-Man tomorrow, hopefully get Feinberg on the program in the second hour on Wednesday for some picks. But right now, I mentioned this earlier, uh, get into our Winnipeg Sports Talk DraftKings contest. We've got a, a room for 100 people, top five win. And we've also got a couple prizes from TaylorMade from our pal Eric Johnson for uh, for that. So, uh, anyways, get in. It's a three dollar contest. Lots of fun. Really looking forward to that. And it is open right now. Um, let's get to uh, the cool bet lines. And of course, don't forget WST at the NHL draft presented by Cool Bet begins two weeks today. We'll see if any of these trades that people are expecting happen before that, or whether it's all going down in Nashville while we're there to hear the picks made on Wednesday and Thursday. Very much looking forward to it. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to this hoops game tonight, the Sea Bears, and I'll probably be keeping an eye on the NBA playoffs on my phone. Uh, Nuggets are a big favorite tonight, minus 357, eight and a half point favorites. I think they get it done. If you're looking for a fun bet tonight, uh, go to the triple-double, Nikola Jokic, minus 102, for a triple double. If you want to bet the Joker on a points total, it's over 30 and a half is the number for Joker points. Um, but again, you got rebounds, blocks, assists. It's all there for you. Uh, and I am hoping that my Nuggets in five prediction comes through and we cash that ticket as well. Um, just quickly, speaking of cool bet, tomorrow, Lock Shop be around 1130 Winnipeg time. And that is going to be our uh, U.S. Open preview show because Dusty's heading away for a couple of days. So we will get to the golf picks tomorrow on the lock shop as well. As far as the NHL goes, Vegas Golden Knights minus 172 favorites to win it at home in game number five. Panthers plus 145 to get things back to South Florida for a sixth game. Uh, and speaking of the draft, of course, Kubet presenting our shows at the draft. I've been kind of paying attention to this quite a bit for the last little while. Adam Fantilli, minus 588 to be the second overall pick. Going to see if there's any movement with Leo Carlson or potential Matt V. Mitchkoff. Interesting that Will Smith's 20 to 1 to be the second pick, but plus 175 to be the third pick. Uh, Leo Carlson, the odds on favorite for that one at minus 130. So you can check that out as well as upcoming. Lines for the Canadian Football League. And, oh, we've got him. He's just came out. Bombers, five and a half point favorites against the Riders on Friday. Uh, opens up with Calgary at Ottawa on Thursday. Calgary's four point favorites on the road. 
Edmonton is in BC on Saturday. That is the BC Lions at six and a half point favorites over Edmonton. And the Ticats, two point underdogs in Toronto to take on the defending Grey Cup champion Argos in their home opener. Argos are going to have to wait till everyone else has played two games before they even get to play one. And uh, no surprise, the Bombers' big week has even cratered their Grey Cup number a little bit more. It was plus 240, now it's plus 225 for Winnipeg. Get on over to Cool Bet. Uh, if you haven't played there before, you can use the promo code WST for a 100% deposit up to 200 bucks for your first deposit. Um, all right, we're going to get to our uh, horse picks. Uh, shout out to the Gold Eyes, though. Uh, just the staff, everything about the game this weekend was so much fun, with the exception of getting worked a little bit by the Kansas City Monarchs, formerly the T-Bones. That's a heck of a squad. Uh, but yes, great times at the ballpark. Team going on the road. We'll check in with Andrew Collier a little later on this week, as we always do. Uh, but looking forward to getting the fish back here. And I mean, every game has seemingly been gorgeous weather for the most part this year. Nothing like afternoon at the ballpark. But they go too fast now. As much as I like the pitch clock, I could use an extra 10 or 15 minutes at the ballpark. The games have been going pretty fast. Uh, and there you go. Of course, goldeyes.com. Um, for group tickets, ticket packages, and information on all their upcoming promos. Oh, and I have to give a shout-out to Carrie Anderson, who had a nice first pitch, and I uh, got a chance to see her and her lovely family at the game as well, as they were a special guest for May Tea Night. Um, all right, let's get Remo back in here. We got to get to uh, we got to get to the track because we're back at it tonight. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, live racing at Assiniboia Downs. And uh, Remo, I know you've been working on your picks. You've got a pretty comfortable lead over me right now. I had a very ugly week last week. I'm here to turn things around today, though, with my selections. I'm, uh, I'm feeling a much better outcome today than, uh, than I had last week. Uh, where are you going with your we'll lead? We'll see. What happens? I just want to say, Hus, I shaved before the start of the show. And like three hours later, still bleeding. So <laughs> if anyone's so got any like yourself off camera. I've been sitting here like I got like all this Kleenex. Like I wasn't going to bring it up on the show, but like <laughs> you can look at me in the first segment. I'm like dripping blood out of uh, here. <laughs> and like I'm it hasn't stopped. I got like an ice pack. Like Have what you do you do? A beard? What? Have you ever tried to no. grow a beard? Uh, the longest I've gone, I think, without shaving is like seven or ten days. It gets too itchy. Like, I got to race, uh, race home. You and, look like uh, you've got pr uh, quite a baby face, though. Like, are you even able to uh, grow a beard? Like, if you did it, yeah, would yeah, it look it was, normal? I've come on here, would and it's be like large decent. Patches? Uh, no, I've come on here, and it's it's good, but um, I just gets too itchy. And really, oh, you just got to wait it out. No, I'm good. Like, it's not comfortable. Uh, we got some suggestions in here. I got uh, an ice a pack. Diptic pencil and got, ice cubes. I got an ice pack. It doesn't Lemon do anything. Lemon juice. I got blood all over this ice pack now. I gotta get more Kleenex. This is terrible. Interesting. Hasn't stopped bleeding for three hours, this this post shave. What if I had like a job interview? That's the worst nightmare, Hus. Shaving. <laughs> well, before. you don't have any job interviews. You've got a job right now. You're at it. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, it looks like, oh, Elliot Friedman reporting Peter Laviolette is in the Rangers head coach. Yeah, it's not a surprise. Interesting. And someone asking, Jay, Laviolette, isn't he canceled? No, he's not canceled. That was Babcock who was canceled for a bit, but he's uncanceled as of June 30th when his uh, contract with the Leafs is up and he's apparently going to go. And I, that's going to be wild to see how that turns out with uh, Babcock. Like, if Johnny Gaudreau knew that he was going to be playing for Mike Babcock in a year, do you think he maybe would have handled <laughs> himself a little differently? Just saying. <laughs> oh, man, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Where, yeah, Patrick Laine as well in Columbus. I'm curious how they're going to do. Probably, like, fringe playoff team. But I think that Wierenski injury last year really screwed them and I mean, they have some decent players. But maybe they, they could use Severinsen, a... Provorov. If Provorov still can maybe turn his, uh... <laughs> he had sort of a rough season last year, but so did most people in uh, most people in Philly. Yeah, um, you know they could use a top line center too, as for to 
play with Goudreau and Line. We have seen a lot of proposals of trading Dubois back to Columbus for Line. Who says no? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Not me. Um, and part of it is that they were able to get Line to sign an extension. Um, albeit, what does he have? Two years left? Or this was it year a huge two, one? Two it wasn't a retirement it was a contract. Deal. No, 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 exactly. It was, a, it was, I believe it was a four year deal. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, we'll, all right. Will we ever a, see your horse picks? Do yeah. You my still, horse picks. I gotta those? pull, I gotta pull them up. I got a bunch of picks today, actually. I'm really spreading out my, uh, $20. Nicely and, uh, done. We got sidetracked. There wasn't, yeah, the, uh, and the Flames did announce their new coach today. Oh, yeah, Ryan Huska. Ryan Huska, yeah. So there's some, there's some hockey news. Young uh, assistant coach getting a chance to go in. It'll be cheap. Um, you know, and I guess when they're paying Daryl Sutter $4 million not to coach the team, um, that would make some sense. Um, but I'll also say he was very, very popular with the players. So, uh, Daryl Sutter? Probably. No, not Daryl Sutter. Huska. Okay. I think Huska was sort of the good cop, bad cop, if you will. Oh, okay. um, very similar to, if you recall back in the days when Arneal and Carlisle were coaching with the Moose, Carlisle was the bad cop. Arnie was the good cop. So Randy would shit all over guys and get you know really pissed off. And then Arnie would sort of build the guys up, and that was a, a good yin yang. Uh, Arnie is great, very very personable guy. Not all coaches are, but if you have a crusty head coach, it's important to have a guy like that to sort of bring the guys up. All right, where are you going tonight? Okay, race one, two, three, exacta, uh, boss factor, golden eyed, bam. Race two, uh, that was a two dollar exacta. But race two, barely regal to win four dollars. Here, you know what? Just we may as well do these together and not go through them all. Okay, yeah, that's so probably you got a good that, plan. I like. Yeah, I like. Got, yeah, we got to switch it up. I agree. Yeah. We don't, yeah. Okay. So race two, I'm actually going with Triactor on this one. Okay. And barely regal, Jeff Fa Fa, yeah. and what's number five? Private Frank. <laughs> yeah, and Private Frank. So uh, I've got the Triactor wheel on that one. Okay, uh, race number three. Yeah. You got any? I got Kim's Texas Bling to win. You got that one? I did the exact same thing. How yep. about Lipstick Lady? You got Lipstick Lady? <laughs> no, I love Kim's Texas Bling. Uh, Kim Texas Bling is one. Again, we bet on horses that we've seen before do well. That often happens in Kim's Texas Bling. That's a good one. Right there, right there. Owned by a Henry Wet. Uh, so oh, that's oh a, another wit horse. Okay, you know I love the wits. That's uh, how you race know. Race number four. Yeah, I got. Oh, I got a triactor box here. Always the little one. First rate romance and celebration dance. That's my triactor box. You're just going with the top three rated horses. Yeah, I'm actually putting two do. on bits of lemon drop, who has never raced before here. Oh, rookie. I'm hoping that I'm like, it's like, you know, being the first one to see a band in a small club before they get to be big. I'm predicting great things for bits of lemon drop. And that's why it is getting a toonie tonight. Okay. I will say I sometimes like to take the best three horses to a, on a triactor box. If like there's a gap between like, there, I feel like there's a big gap here between the top three and then and the fourth one, Peyton Kennedy. So I'll take a shot here. Do the chalk triactor box. That's fine. It's worked yeah, it's out for me. It's just interesting to see if it ends up being uh, worth it with like what the pay is off when there's three obvious horses. That's but true. Again, you're winning this year, so I'm not going to tell you. I'm ahead. Of, yeah, I'm ahead of you. So you should be taking advice from me for these horse picks. What do you got for race number five? I got nothing in five and six. Okay, I have one in five, and it is a very simple. $2, Murdo? $2 win bet on A2 Babu, mm. driven by Antonio Whitehall. I seem to remember A2, although this is a much longer race, I think, than the ones that they've been before. Yeah, this is a seven furlong. Whoa. A2 has been running, like it was first last time, but it was a five furlong. Doesn't have as good of results in the longer races. That being said, that can all change tonight. Let's go A2 Babu. Uh, and then I guess we go to race seven. 
Yeah, I have um, Club Champ to win. How do I not bet on Club Champ? That's, that's a good one. Nice. I actually have Club Champ as well in oh. my triactor. Oh, okay. I've got Richie's Got Swagger, Club Champ, and Lucky Break. One, two, four triactor box for my last six bucks. So uh, there you go. There are picks tonight. Uh, if you want, you can bet and follow the st- uh, the races right from your own home. Watch Kirk and Stretch do their pregame show at 6.45 if you want some more educated picks than ours. Uh, and then they get to post at 7.30, and you can bet like we do at the hpibet.com website. Um, should be a good one tonight, Remo. I'm going to get there maybe tomorrow or Wednesday. But tonight, heading down to see the Sea Bears play uh, home game number two. After uh, a great road trip, they come back four and one, three and one on that last roadie. And uh, now we got a couple more games at Canada Life Center. Yeah, big win uh, on the weekend. Uh, you know, the Bombers were playing, at, what were they playing? Hamilton, sorry. Uh, the Sea Bears were playing okay. their natural rival, Saskatchewan Rattlers, and took them down. Watch over the Sea Bears, Hess. Uh, they're like the Vegas Golden Knights of the CEBL, the expansion team. It comes off to a hot start. I like it. Yeah, and they return home. Filipino Heritage Night as well at the at the court. What are we calling the Canada Life Center basketball? That's our big summer topic. What's what's the name? Because what is it? The Ice Cave? Oh, isn't that what we decided? The igloo? Well, no, the Ice Cave. Well, I guess if the if the ice leave, can can we give the Ice Cave name to the Sea Bears? But at that point, you know what? We'll see. If, if that happens, we'll cross that bridge when yeah. we come to it. The um, North Pole? What are we calling the, yeah. the Sea Bears home <laughs> home court? Hey, listen. Before we go, I got to give thanks to Danimal. Remo, if you recall, during the playoffs, and many people are here, uh, Danimal was the guy that made the bones, uh, that bones medallion on the chain that I wore a few times to the game. So I get to Canada Life or uh, IG Field on Friday, go in the door, say hi to a couple people. And some like I I was barely in the stadium. Some guys came up, hey, Haas, check this out. And it was a Mike O'Shea version of that. I'm like, no way. That is so cool, man. Enjoy. And he goes, no, I got you one too. And the Danimal fires up this beauty. Look at this, gang. How about the Mike O'Shea? You're going to put it on? Yeah, I'll put it on right Pod, now. People on the podcast, come to the podcast. YouTube. Go to the, go to the end. You got to see this thing. There we go. Yeah, go to the end. The Mike O'Shea. We've got, I, well, we, maybe we'll have to put one of these in the background. The O'Shea and the Bones change. Yeah. But anyways, a shout out to Danimal. And, uh. Hey, Rio, you know what? For fun, I've had some people asking me about, oh, I guess that thing is probably not still up on my Instagram. Which? You have uh, you, an Instagram? The, yes, the, uh, the Instagram. The Instagram story that I put up on Saturday night, but those things are usually only around for an you hour, aren't they? You can highlight, do a highlight and like pick old ones. It'll be in your profile. Uh, interesting. Well, I will tell you this. People were asking me where the hell I was because I didn't tag where it was. After the Gold Eyes game, went with a couple friends out to a bar I had not been to in literally over 25 years. And it is the Big A. Ah, the Big out A. Out in St. James. The Assiniboine Gordon Hotel. And we went there because a friend of mine, one of the guys that I was with, a childhood friend of his, is in a band and they were playing, ba- I think it was their first show out. And funny enough, two of the other guys in the band were the organist and the guitar guy from the Jets games. Oh, nice. So anyways, we went there, and uh, the A, it's still standing. It still looks exactly as I remembered it. Um, You know, it was a nice crowd to come and see this band called Wicked Awesome, who was just playing all, like, old classic rock soft stuff. I did did do a... uh, 
uh, an Instagram story of them in the middle of Eye of the Tiger, which was incredible. But what was mostly incredible, and shout out to these ladies, a massive crew of women, I don't want to call them cougars, but they were dressed, they all had that cougar or leopard print as part of their, part of their outfit, doing a bachelorette party who took over the place. Uh, and then, uh, then a bunch of others, like it was about 80, 20 females to males for the debut of this wicked awesome a band. Um, Lou loved all the songs, stayed there for most of the night, had an absolute riot. So on my continued tour, we went to some of the Transcona bars the week before for high neighbor festival. We're getting out to St. James. And in a lot of ways, the vibe of some places in St. James, very similar to T Kona both always an incredible blast and people having a great time. So uh, I'll continue to update you on travels for maybe bars that you haven't been to in 20 years. If they're still standing, big thumbs up for the staff and everyone at the A. Not quite the way we remembered it back on Wednesdays in uh, our uh, early legal drinking years, uh, but it's still there. And uh, it was a heck of a good time. And I'll tell you what, they did do a great job with the TVs, Remo. They've got a bunch of new TVs. We were watching the hockey game while we were there. And whoever was setting up knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They had Blue Jays. They had the uh, CFL game on. They had the oh. NHL game on. They had the Golf Channel. It was like one big TV and two on the side. So uh, anyways, they know what they're doing over there. Shout out to the gang. It was a great time. And uh, yes, I'm sad I don't have the Eye of the Tiger video ready for you, but maybe I'll try and read. Anyone that follows me on this, this is why you should follow me at Hustlerama. Some stuff that we don't put on Twitter just gets up in the IG stories in the middle of the weekend. The big I just remember like Hal Anderson doing promos for the Big A on, on Power 97 and sounded like the place to be. And, you know, I will say that's my biggest pet peeve. You mentioned the TVs. You go to a restaurant or a bar. That has a lot of TVs, and uh, often they're not keeping track of what games are on, and they don't show the right games. For them to have three games on at once in Winnipeg, that's a win. Every time I go out, I am the guy. I'm like, oh, do I have to do this? Am I going to be the guy who goes up to the bar, be like, uh, there's a game on channel, like, and you don't know what – I don't know what any channel number is anymore – because there's so many channels. And yeah, the cable are you on Shaw? Are you on Bell? Well, Shaw's it's got just... like – Three different cable boxes. You could be Shaw, one Shaw. It's this. You've got Shaw Blue Curve. Yeah. It's another. Who knows what numbers the channels are? So you can't can't help them. And so I'm always the guy who goes up and asks them to change. I hate doing it, but someone's got to take the bullet. And yeah, it's usually it's usually me. Well, and that's why I like going to places where I know the staff very well for important things. So you're not just kind of like hail marrying it with people that have no idea. At least if you go to places that you know, um, they'll be like, yeah, no problem. We'll get it on for you. And then you're like, which box are we using? Is it 236 or is this the 813? And listen, you have to go through it all. Yeah. It's not that simple sometimes, particularly at some spots, but in the end, they get it done, and you have the game that you came to watch. Otherwise, you'd probably go somewhere else to watch it. Yeah, and shout out to those places that do have the sound on, too. That's a bonus. Some sometimes Absolutely. they don't. Absolutely. But. BP is always the one thing I'll say about BP, and you can count yes. on that, is that they always are able to get the games, uh, and, and more often than not, they'll have the sound on unless there's something else going on. So. We're going to be, we'll, we'll get ready for a little BP visit tomorrow night, I think, for what I think is going to be the last hockey game. As much as I hope Florida can get it to six, I think it would be the last hockey game of the uh, of the year. Yeah, hey, before we go, I think we got to give a shout out to Mike Malott. That's Jeff Malott's brother. Yes. Big UFC win on the weekend. Watch out for uh, Mike Malott in the octagon. UFC in Vancouver, Huss. Uh, Amanda Nunez going out on top. She's absolutely Incredible. Big fan of Amanda Nunes, but Mike Malott. And also, you mentioned the cup final ending. I'm just going to be watching the celebration all the way to the end, waiting for that moment where Gary Lawless steps on the ice and well, lifts the cup over his head for the Golden Knights. you think we're going to get a picture? Like, how fast do we get a picture of Gary Well, the thing is, the they, I mean, will they, they'll they probably be on the air. He's going to, yeah. I, it'll be like they'll two hours be on after. The air. Listen, trust me. That cup is going to be prominently displayed <laughs> on at Gary Lawless. 
<laughs> at some point, at some point, very soon. I'm so fired that they up win. for this they Gary Lawless Stanley, Stanley Cup. More. And then gonna... the Cup's going to basically spend half the summer here in Manitoba mm. making a trip around it. And, uh, well, dare to dream that it comes back to Manitoba for an actual parade, not just visits to uh, a bunch of uh, a bunch How of other about spots. Lawless, I think he's a pioneer. Grey Cup ring and Stanley Cup ring coming up. Well, so. I, I, there's not too many people that have those. We'll do no. our research. By the way, shout out to everyone that's with us. Uh, Remus is taking tomorrow off. Not oh, going to yeah, be off. here tomorrow. Enjoying, enjoying a very hard, well-earned day off. Although I will say this. Anyone that takes off, like taking a Tuesday off, very <laughs> strange. Like of all the days that you can take off, yeah, I'm going to take Tuesday off. That's fine. Uh, but we all remember Alex, our old pal Alex. He's going to be in doing the show tomorrow. Mike McIntyre is going to jump on the show. The Z-Man, Mark Zacchino, will be on the show. We've got a great draft segment with uh, Tony Ferrari from the Hockey News ready to go for tomorrow as well. And uh, I'll maybe see if Bombing or one of the fellows wants to jump on at the start. And we can uh, talk a little more Bombers and uh, number one things. But yes, Remo will be back on Wednesday. I, however, will be back tomorrow. I'll be at the Sea Bears game tonight. Say hi if you see me. And otherwise, uh, we'll get it on tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Folks, don't forget, tell your friends about Winnipeg Sports Talk if they haven't seen or heard of us so far. We are just about at 9 Point four k subscribers our push to 10k continues uh and it's been great and of course if you miss us on youtube you can always get the audio podcast just search winnipeg sports talk wherever you get your favorite pods and if you see some of those tweets we're putting out for some additional content around the draft fire off an rt send it to a friend we always appreciate that uh bottom line great show today i actually got to run going to go on the sick podcast with tony mariano and talk about pierre luc dubois in montreal so i've got to get some i've got to get some material ready on dubois Man. for everyone in montreal Reem. yeah tony marinero uh, sick podcast also on youtube he's got it no he's got a lot of uh people there i'm nervous i'm like scared of montreal fans ever since mark shifley hit jake evans and we had like our chat bombarded like in our first month of doing this angry Habs fans they were all the they were all um they were all all angry in here and i had to monitor the chat i'm afraid of Habs fans and I'm, you know i put out the video of you and ken talking about pierre luc dubois from friday or from friday's show i put it out on saturday it's got like over seven thousand views and a lot of Habs fans are finding our channel now and uh and weighing in in the comments. So uh, check Hubs that out if you missed it. Always welcome. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> um, but yes, I have a feeling that my take on Dubois might be a little different than many of the ones that they're getting inside the Quebec media. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. That'll probably be up. I think he goes live tonight at 10 Eastern, yeah. so 9 o'clock Central. Uh, you can find that out. Anyways, thanks again to uh, all of our sponsors. Um <laughs> Tomorrow, special lock shop, 11.30 p.m., our U.S. Open show. So those of you can get in, get in the WST U.S. Open contest as well. That's open. Shout out to Eric TaylorMade. I'm going to go pick up a couple goodies to throw in for a little expanded prize. Um, and uh, otherwise, have a great night. Enjoy the weather, everyone. And join myself. Alex Allard's going to be in for Remo. We'll have some great guests. More on Dubois and Hellebuck in this entire offseason. Really looking forward to Mike's visit tomorrow. And uh, Mark Zucchino tees up the U.S. Open from L.A. tomorrow for us. Should be a heck of a good time. All right, for Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. Have a great one tonight, gang, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock right here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, my God! Oh! Oh! Shut it down! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.